no, I think he is here. I was I was a bit confused about that. He went to the next session. So this is so Orkunda, you always hear that. Okay. Yes. 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 Sorry yes. to interrupt. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry. No, we all have our presenters ready to present in the session. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are looking forward to hear Orkun's presentation. Um, it is going to be, if it is in fact named as the Ottoman Revivalist Architecture and the Turkish Identity, Architecture of the Early Republican Era. Uh, let me introduce Orkun Dayoğlu for you. Um, he is uh, graduated from Istanbul Medical University Architectural Department two years ago. And with the same year, he started his master's education at the Istanbul Technical University in the Architectural History Department. He is working as a researcher in ex exhibitions and in published articles with his current research interests, which are in fact Turkish architecture in Republican area, uh, era, sorry, and, uh, and based on the late 19th century Ottoman architecture. So let me introduce Orkun for you. And Orkun, the stage is yours. Thank you for your kind introduction. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So um, what I am going to discuss here is that the actually the embracing of uh, the some of the elements uh, of the Ottoman tradition in the context of a new regime, uh, which is the uh, the Turkic uh, the, the the Turkish Republic, and maybe this can start uh, various discussions on. The, about the last uh, topics that we like uh, talked and listened about uh, some traditional elements and uh, and so on. And um, let me start by uh, briefly telling that the Ottoman state um, begins to lose its integrity with, with a nationalist movement that surrounded the Balkan societies and the, like uh, Europe in the 19th century. However, in order to protect the integrity of the falling state, various ide ideologies have been constructed which put their effects in um, the political and public sphere, especially at the beginning of the 20th century. Among those uh, ideologies, two approaches that stand out are the nationally developing uh, Ottoman nationalism and the Turkish nationalism developed through the Turks who are thought uh, to be the backbone of the empire. Um, architects such as Alexander Valery, Daramko, Yahmund, who work intensively from the state, created a synthesis style by um, combining Western architectural models with Eastern elements that exist in the dynamics of the Ottoman Empire. At the end of the 19th century, this synthesis style was accepted as an element of lack of identity and thus a degeneration by some state officials or architects. Alexander Valery's architectural style can be a fitting example of the synthesis, with sometimes using his design elements such as Eastern style domes, um, some Oriental curves, and even uh, Greek Roman style columns. Throughout the same years, a neoclassical revitalizing style in which traditional elements of Seljuk and Ottoman classical architecture, um, which is the 16th century Ottoman architecture, were used in the context of nationalistic tendencies and the opposite of the mentioned feeling of lacking identity. Um, Ottoman neoclassicism, which was influenced by the first quarter of the 20th century uh, and uh, influenced by the policy of Turkish nationalism, uh, in the power dynamics of the second constitutional era is known as the first national architectural style or period. Although this period was associated with the policies of Turkism in the second constitutional era, the thing that might be holding the state officials and the architects together, um, like the political figures of this period, is the patrimonial gathering of the Ottoman state, unlike its ethnic, religious, or linguistic ties. Because not all of the political figures were Turkish, besides the Turkish architects, such as Vedat uh, Bey, Vedat Tek, 
Kemalettin Bey and Arif Hikmet Bey, Arif Hikmet Koyunoğlu, which hosted the Ottoman neoclassical style in the um, in the early 20th century, there were also non-Muslim architects, such as Mongeri and Azarian, who produced works in this style. Therefore, the revivalist style, which includes non-Muslim architects' designs, who have a place in the revivalist, uh, the who have a place in the uh, style and the state, share their thighs to the state with a high rate. Um, so the style has been not adopted as a Turkish style that forms the backbone of the state. This ambiguity, which leads to better interpretations within the homogeneous structures that the Republic tried uh, to create in Istanbul, Ankara and in other Anatolian settlements is also observable in the Turkish concept of the monuments, public spaces um, and architectural works to be examined in the next sections. So unlike the 19th century and the early uh, 20th century, the new society model that the Republic is trying to construct is a model that is far from the heterogeneous structure of the empire and ties its cultural bonds to much earlier than the Ottoman Empire. In addition to the adoption of the new Latin letters, um, dressing reforms and educational innovation studies such as the Turkish history thesis and the theory of sun language extend the historical ties of the society to Anatolian civilizations and Turkish tribes in Central Asia under a nation state ideology and also under a identity of uh, identity of Turkish Republic. Um, as in the Ottoman Empire, it is aimed to homogenize the, um, the social identity under the roof of a Turkish identity together with the architectural social identity and historical figures by constructing a Turkish supreme identity or the Turkish society, which is thought uh, to be the backbone of the state. In another, in another sense, the, the reforms of the new regime symbolize the break from the identity and the legacy of the Ottoman state. And one small example uh, to the subject can be the tidal transformation of the only architectural magazine in Turkey in the 1930s from the Arabic origin Mimar, uh, which means architect, to the Finnish origin word architect. Because according to the new language theory, the Turkish language doesn't consist an Arabic, Ottoman, Persian mix of words and dialect, but is rather a separate branch related with some Central Asian Turkic languages, even with uh, even related with Finnish and Hungarian. Also, we know that the word architect or architecture is rather uh, a Greek or originated work, but the, but the state is uh, trying to refer to those Central Asian Turkic languages related with Finnish and uh, Hungarian uh, to be thought. Um, although uh, some historical references in the public sphere have been used by almost every state to erase this collective memory that defies the official ideology for the purpose of creating a national unity, the importance of cultural heritage and identity inherited from the Ottoman Empire for the new regime has often been an overlooked element in some historical writings or researches. Although it is thought that a sharp break from the Ottoman heritage and cultural codes was aimed in the ideological stance of the Republic period, it can be said that there was an ideo ideological um, stance that took over the Ottoman social structure and cultural relations and strived to transform this heritage, um, as can be clearly seen in the various actions of the new regime. As an example, um, Ankara Ethnography Museum, designed by Arif Hikmet Koyunoğlu and opened in 1930, is like a threshold between the two sides of the city. Um, as a structure embracing the new capital Ankara, which was started to be built as a symbol of the new regime, but built on the edge of the old city with the old city castle behind it. With its decorations, dome, and the form reminiscent of the works of the first national architectural period, 
in the uh, early of the 20th century, the statue of Atatürk on a rearing horse within the landscape boundaries is a representative of the continuing cultural and architectural tradition of the Republic from the Ottoman Empire. What the Ottoman re revivalist style in the Republican era demonstrated uh, in the early Republican period is that it attempts to legitimize the new nationalist Republican regime in the eyes of the people, in the eyes of um, the Ottoman uh, people by treating the Ottoman Turkish architectural culture, which can be seen before the Republic and using this as a continuity. Um, so the Ottoman revival style also represents its grandeur and patrimonial rule over the public sphere. On the other hand, it reflects the nationalist ideology of the Republic, along with the Turkish supreme identity uh, that the new regime built on the society using the ambiguity of the Ottoman Turkic forms, which refers to the existing cultural hegemony. Because as like Sonmez explains, although the Kemalist elite took a repulsive stance against the corrupt look of the late Ottoman Empire, there was no reason of them not adopting the Turkified and secular parts of their history. There are various examples of the Republican era Ottoman revivalism uh, until the 1950s in the cities of Istanbul, Ankara, Izmir, in, and in some Anatolian cities, many of them built, be, being built between the years of 1925 and 1930. But after the 30s, the Kemalist regime uh, gathers a direction which it will closely become an autocratic state regime in order to accomplish much of the neo modern and Western style reforms in many fields. It is inevitable uh, that the Ottoman re revivalist style of the public sphere will eventually fade out in this decade with the European city planners and architects starting to work in the offices of the state and in universities and forming more clear cubicle and plain architectural designs with also a new Western and modern architectural and educational model. However, it is qu quite clear that the revivalist style continued itself in many different contexts and concepts under the mentioned Turkish identity. One of the important examples of the 1930s uh, architectural model of education and practice is the works of uh, uh, is the works on the typology of traditional Turkish houses by Serhat Hakkı Eldam. By an architect in the early years of the Republic in a very uh, prestigious place, the Ottoman traditional houses were the source of a modern style, uh, which consists the long eaves, material look, and the plan organization uh, of the traditional Turkish houses. Nationalistic tendencies of the Republic and the European nationalism in the 1930s were in a parallel way that it reflects its stance on the architectural style of today. Like the example of traditional um, Turkish house application on uh, buildings or, or the traditional Turkish house style in a modern look and embracing it as an architectural identity. Those traditional houses in various regions of Anatolia and Trace, however, actually made by people which are not only Turkish or Muslim, uh, but also by Greek, Armenian, Jewish, or some other non-Muslim people in the context of the Ottoman Empire. Traditional houses of any common land um, are built by depending on the soil, the geography, and the local materials in the area rather than depending on any ethnic or religious group of people. Thus, it is clear that the Turkicization of the traditional Ottoman, Ottoman slash Turkish slash Greek houses uh, was present under the practice of embracing some reasonable concepts of the Ottoman culture as a continuity uh, in the secular Republican era. It can be seen that also various historical figures are also used within the same identity fiction. Um, the society was able to see some of the historical figures glorified uh, with various discourses in the last period uh, of the empire as Turkish leaders in the Republic. 
Therefore, the new regime could reflect the patrimonial bond of the old state in front of the public in a different way with these figures. Um, architect Sinan and uh, Barbaros Haytin Pasha of the, 19th, uh, of the uh, 16th century and even the various Ottoman Pashas were among those uh, figures in the didactic texts for uh, put forward or educational texts put forward until the 1950s and in the public sphere when historical figures that had created themselves actually in the Ottoman Empire. In the 1930s, Architect uh, magazine, uh, in addition to the text about architect Sinan or Turkish architects of the past centuries, the busts of figures such as architect Sinan and Mithat Pasha uh, in the 1944 Izmir Fair in the same fiction are uh, could be an example of this. In the same years also, Baybaros Hayatim Pasha is mentioned as the great Turkish soldier who won victories for the Turkish Navy with his monument positioned uh, and his sculpture uh, positioned his thumb in Besiktas, Istanbul. With an anachronic approach, uh, these figures exhibited in these busts and uh, those sculptures exhibited in these uh, busts with fez and uh, turbans uh, on their heads and being referred to as Turkish leaders or in a modernist way, colonels or even admirals, together with traditional clothes, are examples of how these elements were Turkified in order to embody the nationalistic imagination of the Ottoman legacy and the new regime, together with the ex existing uh, traditional society of the Republic. In the years of uh, late 19, uh, 1940s, the Turkification and secularization of reasonable Ottoman cultural elements slowly came to an end. As an example, it is worth to mention an imitation of Ottoman mosques, Şişli Cami in Istanbul. The architects, uh, the architect was, uh, the head architect actually was Vasfi Egili, who was graduated from the School of Fine Arts in Ottoman era Istanbul and worked with early uh, 20th century architects like Kemal Ettin Bey. Unlike former examples of collecting some elements in uh, of the Ottoman culture under Turkish identity, the architects actually accept that this mosque is a total imitation and there is nothing to worry about. The text in the architect magazine, Egeli says that, I know very well what some art critics have to say. Couldn't a newer, more modern shape be found for the mosque in the middle of the 20th century, they will say. Theoretically, this is not an impossible thing at all, but for example, the attempts made in France so far have not yielded very root results and so on. And these are nothing more than a collection of incompatible elements. The churches does not, do not look like masterpieces at all. So uh, actually it is not really clear that if any formation of opposition to the Kemalist regime was present within the community of architects in the same years of in the same years of, uh, of 1940s or after the death of Atat Atatürk. But the example of Shishti Jami by Vasfi Egeli is, uh, can be a checkpoint of the Republican era architecture with their exception of imitating the Ottoman style mosques as opposed to the former statues or buildings which are also Ottoman in some ways but not describing themselves the same way. Finally, in the uh, 1950s, uh, the Democrat party government came to the fore with his direct reference to the Ottoman legacy rather than the efforts to Turkify the Ottoman legacy implemented in the uh, past 30 years and to mention the Ottoman heritage and Islamic feelings and thoughts in their election campaigns and discourses. Although it can be said that the policies implemented by the founding bureaucrats of the Republic, the Kemalist regime, uh, which is the opposition of the Democrat Party of the 1950s, contradict the Ottoman identity. Uh, the, it is difficult to say that the existing Ottoman social cultural heritage has undoubtedly been thrown aside. For a new regime that took over the society and social structures uh, from the empire, uh, trying to apply the existing legacy of the of the empire in a new framework 
with its own nationalist policies can be seen as a very uh, possible move, actually. In the transition from empire to republic, social cultural dynamics did not experience a clear break. The examples given in the study, which can be enriched uh, with various examples in the first 30 years of the Republic, show that this transition took place in a rather ambiguous way. In other words, besides the Rep Republic's repulsive stance against the corruption of the Ottoman Empire in the previous years, this shows us that uh, finally it is trying to use the culture of the former regime in its adv advantage uh, with various examples. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, it was a very nice uh, presentation. Thank you. And it's just on time, by the way. So we have the second presenter. I think she's ready, right? Yes. <laughs> You're with it. OK. Hey, just Ojan, one small reminder. If you have any questions, please write in the chat. Uh, we will be answering them, uh, participators will be answering them at the end of the presentation. We have 15 minutes uh, questions and answers period. And before that, we can't actually go into. So therefore, um, let's continue with Komal Potar. Uh, she is going to present us a eidetic mapping for design of historic urban landscapes in spatially heterogeneous city, the case of Jaffa in Israel. Uh, Kumar, before your presentation, I would like to give a brief information about your biography. Um, so Komal is a conservation architect and a PhD candidate uh, at the UDAT. And um, beside, um, she, she has um, quite a lot of um, sponsorships and, and um, prizes that I would like to uh, let you know as well. She is supported by Marie Curie International Training Networks and European Union's Horizon Grants. In the past, she has worked as an in-house consultant with the Archaeological Survey of India in New Delhi and has received Charles Wallace India Trust Fellowship for continuing professional development courses in, in UK. And she was selected as a US e-commerce international exchange program, had been awarded uh, in Intact Heritage Academy Research Grant and was associated with projects for conservation and research uh, in collaboration with e-commerce in Norway. So um, that's quite a bright <laughs> um, biography, Komal. Uh, so the stage is now yours, and we look forward to hear the research on Jaffa. Right. Thank you, Demet, for the introduction. It was very kind. And thank you for this conference um, that I get the opportunity to present my ongoing PhD research, which I began in 2019. So, um, oh, sorry, just one second. I have some problems here. So actually, I can share. Uh, oh, there's can? a lot okay. of animation, so uh, okay. there was issue of internet. That's why I just uh, had a backup plan. So okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Is it visible? Yes, we can see it from our. Uh, if you do it full screen, it's just be better. Full yes, full screen. Yeah. Just give me a minute. Is it full screen now? Yes, it is. Yes. So um, thank you to the organizers of this conference for this opportunity to present my ongoing research uh, with, under the Heriland framework. The title of my PhD is Datascaping Methods for Sustainable Heritage Design. And today I'll be presenting um, a part of this design, uh, of this research, which is eidetic mapping of, for historic urban landscapes in, uh, in spatially complex multicultural cities. And I'm presenting a case of Jaffa in Israel. So um, I'm doing this inductive research based on the statement that contemporary developments pose a challenge for historic urban landscapes, for continuity of identities, and along with the creation of new contemporary features. The Venice Charter of 1964 and World Heritage Convention of 1972, they emphasize on the need of an integrated approach linking contemporary architecture sustainable urban development and landscape integrity based on existing historic patterns and contexts. 
Uh, however, in the Vienna Mem Memorandum of 2005, uh, it emphasizes on the identification of historic urban landscapes and the need to preserve it in a sensitive manner while strengthening identity and social cohesion. The array of elements that make up a city, the relations between them, uh, they remain difficult to describe and map and analyze and analyze it coherently. And this problem is intensified in contemporary cities, which uh, are frequently characterized by increasing social, economic, political, and spatial fragmentation. So this research relies on the four critical concepts of historic urban landscapes, modern development, sensitive practices, and social cohesion. The idea that uh, heritage emerged as a result of historical configurations in uh, cultural, social, and practical relations is well established in theory. And uh, the phenomenon of modernization in historic cities, it um, produces otherness and liminal spaces where the modern urban space is viewed as an antithesis to the derelict historic urban quarter. And this modernity is, um, the urban modernity is somewhat contradictory to the preservation. And there is a need for cognizance of identifying memory and reconstructing it to drive the imminent future design processes. And this thing is uh, often under underrepresented in the decision and decision making processes. So uh, coming to the framework of this study, the historic urban landscapes are embedded within the current and the social uh, expressions and developments that are place based. It is composed of character defining elements that includes land uses, patterns, uh, spatial organizations, visual relationships, topography, vegetation, and other construction details. And taking into account the emotional connection between human beings and their environment, the, the space, the sense of place, uh, it is fundamental to guarantee an urban environmental quality of living to contribute to the economic success of the city. Linking this theory with the new urban agenda of UN Habitat, the Article 14C, uh, it states that ens to ensure the environmental sustainability by promoting clean energy, uh, protecting ecosystems and harmony with nature through sustainable consumption practices and building urban resilience. This brings me uh, to the, the method that I'm trying to derive for arriving at the policy goals. So the study is derived from historic landscape approach, as I mentioned, uh, which includes the elements of landscapes and emphasizes the method of mapping and identifying these urban layers. Uh, by definition, eidetic is involving memory or visual images. And it goes without saying that mapping is never neutral, passive, or without consequences. On the contrary, it is most formative and creative act of any design processes. Hence, it is critical experimentation with new and alternative forms of mapping, uh, and it remains largely underdeveloped and um, limited in its explorations. Uh, as I mentioned, the historical centers, they can be defined as complex systems of spaces and buildings, modified and stratified during centuries. And they have witnessed huge transformations, cultural, political, um, and transformed over time. And these historic towns and cities are co complex manifestations of diverse facets and attributes of geography, economics, trade, social, and cultural aspects. Uh, with the special focus on uh, the historic port town of Jaffa within the Tel Aviv Yafo metropolis in Israel and its diachronic existence, the, these derivatives become more evident and demonstrate a clear picture of how towns come into existence, thrive, and face decline and neglect due to the shifting power relations and cultural and social constructs. As um, James Conner writes that mapping is neither secondary nor representational, but doubly operative, which includes digging, finding and exposing on one hand and relating and connecting it and structuring it on the other hand. Uh, hence the creative view of mapping in the context of architectural landscape um, is, is relevant in the changing nature of today's temporal structures and today's world. So here I explore the research question of how can Jaffa be identically mapped to facilitate design decisions and as an inductive method to explore how is mapping an operative tool to inform new approaches for design decisions. For a research-based uh, approach to contextually analyze the theory, the case of multicultural city of Jaffa, no, historically known as Jaffa in Israel is selective. 
Tel Aviv Yafo is a dynamic contradicting urban reality owing to historical and political events in Israel. This historic port town existed as a thriving port uh, on the ancient Via Mari and uh, was a pride of Arab commerce. And the foundation of Tel Aviv as a modern Jewish city uh, marginalized Jaffa and created an Arab minority within a Jewish majority owing to the political events. The modern city of Tel Aviv, it became a world heritage in 2003 and Jaffa became its cultural tourist hub on the fringes of this modern city. It is multicultural owing to the Jews, Arabs, Christians living in the neighborhood, as well as many migrant communities from Yemen, Africa, and Egypt. And the social composition of Jaffa is a representation of the shifting demographics and also has a bearing on the spatial configurations. The phenomenon of modernization is a common occurrence in this historic uh, multicultural city. On one hand, the modern, clean, well-planned Tel Aviv city is always ha has always been a contrast with the backward, um, unplanned Jaffa. And due to this, profound influences on economic, social, and political transformations are seen on the spatial planning mechanisms as well. Uh, I describe this spatial heterogeneity, which is observed in Jaffa, as the system where the parts of city are subjected to divergent modes of growth, behavior, and development. The, the socio-spatial configuration of Jaffa's town center were interwoven in narrative of the landscape uh, and evolving land uses, which included agriculture, industrial, and residential. The grandiose of this port town owing to its economic vitality was well demonstrated by the grand palatial houses in oriental architecture and having elaborate enclosures, uh, orange groves, wealth structures built by wealthy residents. The, the historic urban landscape of Jaffa is, um, is the urban uh, area understood as the historic layering of natural and cultural values and attributes extending beyond the notion of the historic center or the ensemble, which is defined uh, by the World Heritage Conventions to include the broad, broader urban context and its uh, geographical settings. This research attempts to study the landscape through its topography, geomorphology, hydrology, and natural features and its built environment. It also includes the social and cultural practices and values, uh, economic processes and tangible dimensions of heritage related to the identity and diversity of the communities. Um, in the next series of maps, um, I, will illustrate, I will illustrate series of eidetic maps through their historic urban landscape attributes, which are extracted from the 1799 map demonstrated earlier. Uh, the aim of this exercise is to explore the research question of how can Jaffa be identically mapped to facilitate design decisions. So here in red, if you see my cursor, uh, is the ancient fortress, fortress of Jaffa, which was built in 13th century by, in the Byzantine period, which thrived later in the Ottoman period in the 16th century. The fortification was demolished in 1879 for the expansion of town. And uh, here, if we study the contours uh, and the topography, uh, it is crucial to map the valleys and, ridge and the ridges of the landscape. The fortress of Jaffa is built on a high ridge to serve, as, serve for the purposes of monitoring the sea. The, another layer that I've mapped is the commercial port towns and religious structures, as well as the connections to other important Palestinian cities of Akko, Nablus in the north, Gaza in the south, and the pilgrim route to Jerusalem to the, to the east of uh, Israel. Studying this landscape with reference to topography and contours, it reveals the natural existence of the swamp area, which you see here in blue. These swamps are called as kurkars in Hebrew. And if further studied to the lens of geology, it can be ascribed to the presence of calcareous sandstone or greenstone, which is a porous bedrock. It is found on the Levantine coast on the Mediterranean Sea in countries of Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, and Gaza Strip. The Canaanites referred to this as Bassa or Bissa. The Romans called this Bezeth as the Romans called it as Bezeth. And the Crusaders, um, the village was known as Ain al Bassa. Another layer is of the well houses. As I mentioned, the porous bedrock, the presence of groundwater was utilized to benefit uh, to the benefit of developing this region. And well houses were a significant feature of this port town. 
and because of abundant water being available, this led to practice of agriculture. The traditional systems of Mawasi agricultural practice uh, prevailed where, where the upper level of coastal underground water was used for growing grapes, palm trees, other crops, and also to protect the farm and the crops from encroaching sand dunes. Mawasi, the term Mawasi in Arabic means suction, referring to the water that has been sucked out to the surface. The land was then further cultivated for agriculture and number of Arabic villages were created in this region and cultivation of orange began during the Ottoman period in the 16th century as a result of trade to the Far East and it became the center of commercial activity. For this presentation, I have chosen this map of 1799 and compared it to the current day city map. However, a detailed examination and eidetic mapping will involve a series of archival maps from different time periods. Upon overlaying these eidetic layers of the archival maps with the present day city map, we observe the tremendous urban growth which has taken place over centuries. And also the swamp area has been construct, uh, constructed upon in the past decades uh, to accommodate the new housing and public spaces. This exercise highlights that the historic urban design processes were in harmony with geography and topography of the land. And it brings me to the question that the current urban practices and planning, how do they address or take in consideration the natural topography and assess for new designs and decisions? Um, I analyzed the past events of this region, which is currently part of the Giveth Herzl neighborhood, which also saw the construction of Bloomfield Stadium in 2005. And in 2020, last year, Israel witnessed huge rainfall, and it was observed that this particular neighborhood was inundated and flooded and caused massive discomfort to the residents. This highlights the fact that the lacuna uh, in, in the planning processes and how the current urban design uh, systems do not include the traditional wisdom or the historic landscape characters while decision making. Such eidetic maps uh, gather and show things which are presently invisible and things which may appear incongruous or untimely, but which may also harbor enormous potential for unfolding alternative informations. Similarly, by analyzing historic and archival photographs, uh, the amount of information can be captured uh, in terms of land cover, terrain, and spatial configurations for sensitive design methods. Here in red, the same area is highlighted and compared with the archival image and the current day 3D simplex model for assessing the change in land covers. Through photographic documentation of certain areas, the historic city, the layering with respect to attributes can be mapped. The geospatial analysis of historic urban landscapes has the potential to document and reconstruct a palimpsest of information of the spatial configurations and their tychronic uh, social and cultural evolution. Another example of comparing an aerial photograph of 1932 with the 3D model generated by Simplex for Tel Aviv municipality, it demonstrates the diachronic evolution of landscape and provides us with a tool to document as well as assess the developments uh, if they are ensuring environmental sustainability and to build urban resilience. Here in red um, and yellow, uh, the two developments of the Slope Park uh, on a reclaimed land and the Andromeda high-end housing complex are compared to the historical setting of the town. And this is a method of inquiry towards socio-spatial heterogeneity. This brings me to the second part of my research, which is assessment of historic urban landscapes for social and cultural cohesion as prescribed by the Vienna Memorandum. And for this purpose of eidetic mapping, uh, multiple layers uh, for the need of revalorization of cultural heritage, I have taken three case of maps, which is the Atlas of Palestine, a 1940 map, a map of self-guided tour of Ajami, which is an area in Jaffa, by the Tel Aviv municipality and um, a Jaffa 2013 map, which is a vision plan for tourism uh, as an inclusionary and identity revival project uh, to strengthen the Arab identity and narrative. Uh, so this overlay indicates the contradicting narrative of present day infrastructures and narratives of the cultural tourism, which is limited only to the old Jaffa and the Jewish and Christian heritage. The Palestine Atlas provides information of many Islamic cultural built heritage, out of which some have been ravaged due to the war of 1948. 
Comparing it to the present day tourism extent in Jaffa, it is limited only to old Jaffa and few tourist spots. Although most of the Arabic heritage has been lost due to war, the memory of the old Jaffa port persists through the vestiges of history and landscape, which needs to be acknowledged in the tourism plan to mitigate the segregation and promote social inclusion through cultural tourism. The historic landscape of Arabic cultural um, heritage includes historic neighborhoods, orange orchards, and also the modern city architecture, which is hard, hardly promoted in the cultural tourism context. This exercise aims to portray the partition zone and highlight the conflicting narratives of the multicultural city and devises a method to document and promote the shared cultural heritage, taking the historic urban landscape approach. To bring to uh, explain the conclusions of this study, documenting landscapes as an anecdote to the spatial memory, identity and transition has a potential for reconnaissance of values and attributes. Uh, this exercise is to enhance our understanding of the challenges to urban design and planning for social inclusion and sustainable economic growth. The method is especially applicable in the case of multicultural historic cities, which are ethnically partitioned and less, uh, where less informed decisions can accelerate the socio-spatial segregations and heterogeneity. Applying this method in processes of decision making by including communities has the potential to identify the lacuna and in the current design uh, and decision taking frameworks and future initiatives could thereby be motivated by interpretive datascaping and mapping to, in, to be included in master planning, policy guidance and urban design to in an attempt to mitigate the socio-spatial segregations. Uh, at the, in the end, to to quote David Lowenthal, the past remains integral to us all, individually and collectively, and we must concede the ancients their place, but their past is not simply back there in a separate foreign country. It is assimilated in ourselves and resurrected in an ever-changing present. And if maps are essentially subjective, interpretive and fictional constructs of facts and constructs that can influence decisions, actions and cultural values generally, then why not embrace the profound efficacy of mapping in exploring and shaping new realities? Thank you. Thank you, Toma. It was a very nice presentation. It was really interesting to see all these layers of, of the construction, urban texture. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll say. So we have our third presentation uh, from uh, just please help me out in 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 pronunciation but Sozi and Norik Nevo. Um so I guess uh Miss Beshitwan you will be speaking right uh no Norik uh, with Janus as well ah okay he's here normally okay so uh the presentation is uh, named as Ma'an, a crossroads city, which is quite interesting, I believe. I'm looking forward to hear personally. So let me introduce you both for our audience. So Dr. Beshetwal has a PhD in history and history of technology. She is a state urban planner and architect at the cultural ministry in France and uh, a conservation architect with a postgraduate degree from Ecole de Chaillot. Chaillot? <laughs> and she's a research associate at IFPO. And Norik Nevo, um, she is also a PhD with a research fellow uh, and, a, and a research fellow at CNRS. Uh, as a special, specialist of modern history, she has been conducting research for the last 10 years for Middle East, especially consulting various archives and doing interviews with witnesses of history. On, and, and her research focuses on sacred topographies and religious authorities in Jordan and the Palestine since the late 19th century. Uh, she has published several articles on local pilgrimages, heritage, religious tourism, and its impact on local societies. So the stage is now yours. Um, and I am just muting myself. I will uh, share my screen. Okay, thank you. Just a moment. Um, I will let uh, Norig start. 
Yes, please. Shall I begin? So yeah, we'll have this two voice presentation if you, if you don't mind. So hopefully the my connection will be good enough. So our presentation is focusing on the city of Man, which is uh, actually located in southern Jordan, uh, close to the border of uh, Saudi Arabia. And to give you like quick um, view of the history of the city, at the beginning of the 20th century, Maran had quite a great uh, regional importance. Uh, it was located in South, so it, it is today located in, in Southern Jordan. It was located at the south of uh, Vilayat Surya uh, at the end of the, of the uh, Ottoman rule. And it used to be a local meeting place for tribes, local tribes, but also uh, a, a crossroads for commercial ca caravans. So, it used to be a regional crossroads and in different way uh, for, as I said, commercial caravans, but it was also a station on the pilgrimage road to Mecca and Medina. So it has this uh, local importance, but also a different scale, a regional importance, as I said, as a crossroads. And the city, and we will develop this further on uh, more, was divided into two villages, Man Shamiye and Man Hejaziye. So it, it was like a two-part uh, uh, city. Uh, at the intersection of, of uh, as I said, two major trading areas uh, with Egypt, Syria, uh, it was also a connection. It was located at the connection with, uh, with uh, the, the, the Arabic uh, Peninsula. So why did we decide to, to focus on Ma'an with, uh, with Swazik? Because the city is actually quite uh, original for Jordan in its um, urban fabric and it's uh, also um, heritage. So it's, and, and Swazik will develop this more further on. It's, uh, it's old mud brick built which is quite an originality for Jordan, where most of the towns and city have been built with, with stones. And uh, as this heritage is quite fragile, it's, and it's going under the appearance uh, today. So, and it's, and so it's also this, this aspect, but it's, 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 it's an endangered uh, heritage uh, since, I mean, I would say since the last decade. For, for different reasons, and that's uh, the purpose of the of the presentation. And um, so, we started to work work on this uh, on this city with Swazig in uh, 2018. Uh, as I did part of my PhD uh, on uh, social history of Man using the the Ottoman archives, uh, also the 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 court. Uh, registers uh, from the Ottoman period. So I had this social history background, but, uh, and also did lots of field work in, in the city, but we, we decided to, to cross um, use our historian perception with the architect's perception of Swazig, uh, which was really useful urban fabric of the city and which was also really useful in her historical perspective to understand the practices of the city. I don't know if Swadik you want to say like quickly yes. uh, one word about your perspective. Yes indeed. Um, from the analysis of the Anson Center from the point of view of the heritage and the use of the city it makes possible to read the urban form and all the aspects that concern the human resource as uh, habitat, infrastructure, transport, economic activity, etc. So we start an uh, historical an, um, analysis and an inventory of the current remains and uh, the study of typological and morphological characteristic of the urban, fa of the urban fabric. So, we start inventory documentation of the heritage uh, as a long-term work, and uh, it was key to our analysis. Our methodology also allows us to see the um, architectural and urban landscape as a whole, and uh, it makes possible to understand the different types of heritage held in man. 
and uh, we work with the support of the municipality of Man, the university cooperation department of the French embassy and the uh, Hussein uh, Bin Al Talal University, uh, the Department of Archaeology and Anthropology. And um, uh, it's helped us also to introduce and train interns at the technique of architectural survey, documentation, and collection of oral history. So, yeah, maybe to, so, so the, the um, the purpose of the presentation is to, to, to propose uh, an architectural study uh, of, of the city and to, I mean, to describe the, the I mean, to propose a description of the, of the urban part of the city uh, with the perspective of heritage studies, also critical heritage studies and putting into perspective the question of uh, preservation of those, uh, of those heritage. So uh, again, to give you a brief, uh, brief element of context about about Man, uh, the district Man district used to to uh, constitute a border territory between the Ottoman province of Damascus, Egypt, and Hejaz. And um, this, according to different testimonies from the beginning of the 20th cent uh, century, uh, reflects and influence the architectural uh, practices in Man, but also the, the customs of the inhabitants of the, of the city. And so the idea would be that the coastal situation was mirrored into the, the urban practices of, uh, of uh, Amman's, uh, Man's population. Um, one important element in terms of importance, importance of the city is the construction of the Hejaz of the 20th century, the station, I mean, the train arrived in Man in uh, 1904, and uh, it brought more vivacity to the, to the vivacity to the, to the city. It made, I mean, as I said before, it used to be an important commercial crossroads, and it became much more important after the, the, the construction of the, of the railway. So Man was located at the intersection of those different commercial flues, uh, with so connections with northern um, Syria, so going into Lebanon and the and the port of Beirut, which was in, in in expansion at this time, but also the Palestinian coast with Gaza, Egypt, and it was also a way to connect, as I said, the the uh, Arabic Peninsula and especially Mecca and Medina. So we have many uh, testimonies uh, okay, uh, about of the 20th century, and I will take one example, which is one of uh, an Orientalist traveler which, who, who used to be a uh, father at the biblical school of Jerusalem. And I quote, he says, three main hours in this gloom and suddenly there is none. The town is marked by the clumps of trees in its magnificent gardens for its mud brick houses stand out uh, in the surrounding desert. In the interior, one crosses canals and walks between heights, blind walls over which branches laden with fruit pass. Uh, few, um, yeah, sorry. So two almost rival quarters stood opposite each other, almost a kilometer apart, near to the north, and a small rise in the plain with the spring and the finest orchards and El Hajazi to the south, with shops for foreigners, reservoirs for the gardens, and a serai for the Turkish Kaimakan. So yeah, on the, on the screen, you have different what man used to be at the beginning of the 20th century. So of course, I mean, for, for historians of the Ottoman period, it's not, uh, it's not, it did not used to be uh, uh, a city of the size of Cairo of Damascus at this time, but it's very used to be a regional capital, uh, one could say, and in expansion at the beginning of the of the 20th century. So, as mentioned in this uh, in this in this uh, citation of uh, of this traveler, Man was divided into two cities, the Shamiye and El Hajaziye. Uh, El Hajaziye was the biggest of those two cities, with almost 2,000 inhabitants. It was much more smaller with like um, about one, uh, 100 families. So about like mm, 1,000 
inhabitants. So of course, the proportion of the of the tone was was quite uh, quite small. And thus, Maria Maran was this uh, boundary city, uh, and it was oriented towards north and south in terms of distance, um, uh, but also in terms of of urban fabrics and as stressed right now, the, 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 the building fab, uh, heritage is much more influenced by the one of the uh, Arabic Peninsula and, and uh, in particular of El Ula and Tabuk, which are located much more, I mean, uh, at the south of the, of the city. So um, now we will talk about man urban heritage. Indeed, uh, man could have been uh, built in stone. Nowadays, man is one of the most important white limestone quarry in Jordan. And the white stone of man mainly, uh, are mainly used as a facing, uh, are highly valued and appreciated in, Ma in Amman. So the fact that 90% uh, of man was built in Adobe uh, show a cultural influence to South Arabia oasis. Also, all the gardens are built in separate area and not in the continuity with the house. This practice is not found in other cities of the Transjordan, where small pleasure gardens are built in continuity of the house when the olive tree are uh, constructed in farm and are built far from the city in village. On the other hand, um, man urban planning is less dense than the old Alwa oasis, for instance. And this type of uh, urban plan is more coming from Transjordanian culture. So the urban markers clearly shows um, the regional influence and the fact that man is a crossroad city um, is also reflected in the urban plan. And this uh, aerial photography from 1953 uh, showed the disposition of the city at the beginning of the urban connection uh, and the urban connection, sorry, between Man Al uh, Al and the village of um, Man Al Shamia. The garden area are clearly visible as well. And uh, as you can see, the urban plot is, as you said, quite close. Um, so, yes, so. Um, this aerial photography showed the evolution of the town planning with the impact of the desert highway uh, from Man to Aqaba. And uh, nowadays, the development of the city is uh, more to the north and uh, for the housing and to the west for the industrial zone to be connected to the desert highway. Today, unfortunately, the urban heritage and uh, all the mud brick have largely disappeared and have been replaced with a new construction in cement. Uh, the few examples still standing are only keeping for storage use uh, as for goat, camel, or chickens. And uh, while they were rich residents organized most of the time around the country yard with a nice tree uh, that got saved. So the other remains still, still visible today at the Ottoman city are the Ottoman citadel, which is regularly restored as, uh, because it's a Jordanian monument, and the old souk, uh, which is uh, still very uh, much alive and where people can find only the necessary to, um, for living in the desert. So it's still quite um, famous in the area. But um, given the time available, we have chosen to focus this presentation on the gardens because they are the most important remains of what the city was to, uh, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Their gardens remain uh, strong markers of uh, this unique urban culture uh, on a trans Jordanian scale. First of all, the walls. The walls are made using adobe technique. The adobe is a technique of raw earth brick, previously modeled by hand. Uh, it's a mixture of clay, straw, and water mixed with, uh, and modeled in a wooden frame from bricks and then dry in the sun. The ground supporting an adobe structure is compressed as the weight of the adobe wall is significant and the foundation uh, certain may cause cracking of the wall. Here in Mayan, you can clearly see that at the bottom of the foundation, uh, it's based on river stones 
and the other brick walls are laid by uh, mud mortar, mortar to use as the same property as the brick. Adobe uh, has a low structural strength. So in man, the wall of the garden don't rise above two levels. And um, finishes applied uh, um, in order to protect the exterior of the adobe walls uh, is always mud plaster. Um, this protect of the adobe walls from, uh, from the water damage, but it needs to be reapplied periodically. Man adobe construction mainly uh, deteriorate because of moisture, uh, rainwater uh, fall, and uh, groundwater. The successful of uh, stabilization um, of this um, of this wall is uh, um, uh, due to uh, the the finishing. But um, as we can see, um, for example. And now um, it's the clear weakness of the walls uh, because uh, of lack of maintenance. So at the top, there is less and less finishing so that um, a lot of water to penetrate inside the wall and, um, and make it uh, slowly disappear. Uh, for instance, here you have a top finishing. Uh, usually it was made from small branches but uh, this technique needs a lot of maintenance and uh, people want to place this technique by metal plates, which can also be all container, as you can see, we use in the wall. Um, also, we can find, of course, uh, openings. So for door, it's a very simple uh, lentil placed on the top of the opening to support the brick above. The openings are always small and limited it to provide to avoid, sorry, uh, structural problems. The structure of the man garden is clearly linked to the irrigation system of the city. Although the two main ponds are no longer filled with the water from the wadi, uh, the canals are still used and two systems uh, were juxtaposed, uh, a shared irrigation system from the ponds and the more private system with the uh, well or system system inside the garden. So in, for instance, in Man al Shamir, you can find two main ponds. And here you have picture of the canal still in use, but uh, now they are connected to the city water supply. And when the water, um, and then the water is uh, um, linked to the garden, so um, the water for the canal is uh, then converted uh, to the foot of the trees or plantation by a system of digging in the ground. The organization of the water supply was according to a system of cana. So the water was passed at certain time of the week to all the garden, but each owner can only deviate it uh, in terms to irrigate his own garden. Um, here you have some picture of uh, private wells and ponds inside the gardens. And here you have a picture of uh, the pilgrim wells, which was a shared space. Uh, also, one of the characteristic of, garden, of the man gardens are its towers. The origin of its structure is difficult to establish why, why it was a tower. But there are many uh, urban, uh, if there are many urban legends about it, it seems, however, um, that they were used uh, as garden shelters for equipments, barns, and they were also used um, uh, to provide a cool place to sleep during summer. Uh, only a few of their uh, towers are still in use uh, today. Oh, excuse me, your last one minute. Okay. So it's your turn, Noreen. Uh, so I'll be very brief because <laughs> I'll try to be very brief with that. So yeah, um, just to to maybe to to sum up the the idea of the of the of the part I was supposed to to, to develop uh, the the question of uh, preserving our man heritage was I mean at least from the beginning of from the 20th century, already an issue. 
and we have many testimonies of travelers, Ottoman administrators, or local people, like showing and, and, and stressing that uh, the preservation of the mud walls were, were, were a real preoccupation and issue for the people living in, in the city. So the, this question of uh, preserving the, the built heritage uh, should be also uh, approached in a long-term way. And uh, uh, the, the idea in this in this, of this collaboration with Swazik was also to 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 begin with the with the the, the actually local practices. How would people on a long term approach preserve their own heritage and their own built heritage? And the the, the whole question about preserving man's built heritage is also is related to the to the question of access to the water because as uh, Swazik stressed just before those gardens had a really uh, important uh, economic role in the city uh, from the beginning of the 20th century of, of, I mean from the 20th century beginning of the 20th century they would uh, be used to provide fruits vegetables that may be used by the local population but but, but also that would be sold to the pilgrims and to the in in the frame of the of the trading organized or in mind. Uh, lately, most of the of the production in terms of fruits and vegetables are used by by locals for the I mean in, for, for the for the local lo, local economy. So uh, one of the reason is that man have uh, have suffered of different flooding uh, from the 60s, 70s, 80s. And those flooding uh, actually erased most of the built heritage, especially of the city. That's why we've been focusing on the on the on the gardens because most of the of the houses themselves have disappeared from those floodings. And so, so some some uh, some different system to to preserve the water to 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 uh, floods were were built uh, in man and it. It made the access to water difficult, so the use of the gardens for 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 agriculture become really low for the local people. Uh, new practices developed out of those gardens, uh, usually on the heights, when those gardens were actually built close to the way, the small river, uh, and and. Um, so it's also um, reorganized all the social organization of, of the city as, as the gestion of the water was an important uh, issue uh, locally, uh, as also the, the agricultural organization was, was an issue. And as the spaces of, of the city itself changed with people abandoning the gardens to resettle in different way. And, and it's really costly costly for, for locals to take care about those mud brick uh, buildings. That's the reason why uh, the, the heritage itself is, is disappearing. So the old question, which uh, is more an issue that Swazi would, would tackle, is how to, uh, to reuse those buildings in order to not have them disappear. And I don't know if, I mean, I mean so that could yeah, be part of the conclusion. And sorry for having, for taking too much time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this interesting presentation. Yeah, that's the major question, how to reuse the buildings in order to not to lose. So let's keep this in mind. And, and frankly, I look forward to hear Frederic Biele's presentation also for my design studio practices. It will be quite helpful. But first, please, um, um, let me introduce you, uh, Frederick Biele, but and, and his uh, presentation's name, the actual and its double exper experiential learning from historic urban fabric pedagogically considered. 
Um, Frederick Biele is a practicing architect and an adjunct professor at Pratt Institute. Uh, he was awarded uh, the Prix de Rome Fellowship in Architecture, allowing him to live and study in Italy for some time while he was doing the research remaining of the ancient Roman urbanism. He is currently the coordinator of the Pratt Rome program, uh, focusing on learning from the fabric of the historical city. His other primary researches are focusing on the affordable housing in New York City, developing proposals to reinvent superblock public housing projects by reintegrating them urbanistically with their surroundings. So, Frederic, the stage is yours. Thank you. So my screen is up, I take it. Thank you, I just wanna say I am enjoying the conference, at least uh, that uh, part of it that I can attend. Uh, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to present today. Uh, this paper might be a little different in that it's about a pedagogy for teaching contemporary urban design in a relationship with historical fabric. So its success is measured less by the specificity of a solution and more by the acknowledgement of a possibility. Um, I hope you find it an interesting diversion from all of the other things we've been listening to. So the actual and it's double experiential learning from historic urban fabric pedagogically considered. I'm gonna begin with a quotation from Sir Jeffrey Scott's architecture of humanism. Quote, architecture, is an art of design based on the human body and its states. We transcribe architecture into terms of ourselves. Through its spaces, we can conceive of ourselves to move. Its masses are capable, like ourselves, of pressure and resistance. Its lines, <clears throat> excuse me, should we follow them, might be our path and our gesture. The concrete spectacle stirs our physical memory. It awakens in us that condition of the spirit which belongs to our actual experiences. We look at a building and identify ourselves with its apparent state. The tendency to recognize in architectural form the image of our physical functions is the true basis of a critical appreciation. The tendency to project the image of those same physical functions into architectural form is the true basis of its creative design. <clears throat> Although published in 1914 as a manifesto in support of classicism, Scott's definition might be seen to have even greater currency for the student of contemporary practice today, as design methodologies have moved away from history as an inventive reference to embrace more tangential possibilities for making, as the studio design process promotes instead transformational research for the determination of form and meaning, it is the body and human function as the provider of vertical orientation in relation to horizontal movement and as a conditional measure and spatial determinant that remains the critical benchmark. Stripped of literary fancy, the historical imagination, the casuistry of conscience and the calculations of science, that's another quote from Scott, it is the body and human function that are qualifiers with which the tangents of architectural form making must eventually identify. With the critique of the body's transcription research can still pass into the realm of capable proposal, setting forth an accommodation of program, a condition of scale, the physicality of materials and the mechanics of construction. The body and architecture, to fully appreciate this relationship, the student must be keenly aware of his, her own spatial experience conscious of architecture's physical appearances, its spaces, masses, and lines, as well as determined to understand the means for representing it. This is what has been called by Alberto Perez Gomez, operating in the world as lived. An interest in the physical circumstances of the world around inspires a diverse memory of spatial experience, something the intellect will require in order to operate intuitively in conjunction with the problem-solving criteria of architectural design. Architectural pedagogy, however, still typically begins from the opposite position by intentionally displacing experience from representation. A student, a design student today is most likely, at least in the US, 
introduced to the world of constructed form elementally and reductively with a problem descended from John Haydock's nine square exercise given at the Cooper Union between 1964 and 1985. The nine square problem presented architecture as a self-contained and abstract discipline. The site is a cubic geometric measure subdividable into relative parts or sections, elements, columns, and beams, typically increments of a site's measure, as well as planes and openings, all of which had to be assembled to shape a space of intellectual habitation. In this world, there could be no personal association or nostalgic reference. Haydick said about it, quote, working within this problem, a student begins to discover and understand the elements of architecture, grid, frame, post, beam, panel, center, periphery, field, edge, line, plane, volume, extension, compression, tension, shear, the student begins to probe the meaning of form and its representation in plan, elevation, and section, end quote. At the beginning of book six, for, in his 10 books of architecture, Vitruvius relates this, the story of the Socratic philosopher Aristippus being shipwrecked and cast ashore on an unknown coast. He despaired until he observed geometrical figures drawn upon the sand, whereupon he cried out to his companions, let us be of good cheer, for I see the traces of man. For Vitruvius, a composition of lines, because they have been measured out and drawn specifically in a relationship to each other, can suggest not just the presence of another person, the maker of the marks, but an entire culture, a civilization, and its accomplishments. For a student, the kit of parts intends to introduce these same geometric possibilities from which he or she must learn to reinvent the accomplishments of history as an evolving ritual of self-knowledge. The intrinsic value of working with abstraction is to focus a student's understanding of architecture as a form of language. Fluency with the language will ultimately allow the architect to express his or her ideas. No doubt, like Aristippus, there will be moments of despair, of getting lost, and I would argue that these moments are the critical thresholds within the learning process. The student must seek out, must discover, and define for themselves rather than be given the necessary associations that are actually around them in the real world. The process of this learning is also incremental and quite slow, as architecture is not something immediately grasped. Architecture is a representational discipline, and so the student must also be introduced to the graphic means to present an actual or imagined space, orthographic projection. Understanding constructed spaces as a set of relationships relative to the horizontal and vertical plane of section is quite different from visualizing a moment in time. The ability to construct syncretic representations is itself a transformation, an intellectualizing of actual experience, and thus again a step removed. From this dialectical starting point between a new language of form and its representation on the one hand, and the currency of one's actual experience, on the other, a true architectural education proceeds. In an effort to bring the actual, which is experience, and its double, which is its representation, into a direct and immediate relationship. Perhaps the most important threshold in a student's education is in recognizing the possibility of this connection, the referential knowing that must accompany the means and markings of the page. While the idea of drawing remains constant, the mechanics of visualizing continue to evolve. Appropriation is now a command, and with it comes a profundity of accessible imagery. Such a delirium would present itself as a substitute for actual experience, obscuring the more critical path for understanding, operating in the world as lived. Actual learning requires a persistent back and forth between drawing and visualizing on the one hand and seeing and physically experiencing on the other. Through this exchange, a maturation occurs from eyes that do not see to the hands that remember, an ability to better represent and thus communicate the physical characteristics of one's own ideas. It is a process that can take years, uh, even years beyond the terms of a student's formal degree. Into this incremental pace of abstract consideration and virtual speculation, the study abroad tr or travel studio is ideally located. The Pratt Institute undergraduate architecture uh, for, uh, for them, uh, this takes place in Rome, Italy during the fourth year of a five-year professional degree program. And I can say that it's like a bomb exploding. 
In Rome, the bias of the three previous years of virtual learning is turned upside down from a focus on imagining and the representation, the, the re and the representation of that which has not necessarily been experienced to a world of unexpected experience where there is neither the time to confront it nor the satisfactory means to represent its challenge. Rome is still perhaps the most remarkable library of spatial experience in the world. The encounter with this city, foreign yet familiar, profound and contradictory, will inevitably question any student's design priorities. It is a place where, where city and building remain interdependent, and so investigating its urban fabric as well as the antique remains that interrupts and informs it offers a very different understanding as to urban history's ethical value. In a commentary that placed the essay, Literal and Phenomenal Transparency, into the broader context of the historical city, Bernard Hosley said, quote, one has to be willing to renounce a fixed point of view. One has to be prepared to see contrasting and even contradictory spatial notions as not necessarily excluding each other and accept that certainty can only reside in a temporary stage of an ongoing dialogue. This idea of uncertainty can again recall the shipwrecked Aristippus, as uncertainty is also the spatial reality or discovery that is wrong. To inhabit this place for a period of months is to be given a truly remarkable opportunity. Uh, as Lorenzo Pignati said yesterday, the challenge of its history and to come to terms with some of its possible realities and uncertain truths. The pedagogy of Pratt Institute School of Architecture in Rome, like many others, of course, prioritizes the experience of the physical place. But the design studio chooses to do this by foregrounding the less identifiable historical fabric, the city's more intimate rather than its grand spaces. This is the labyrinth into which each student must step. The familiar will be lost. Finding a way out will require an awareness that urban form and space are engaged in a collective dialogue that the space of urbanism is not merely the leftover, but something shaped collectively, and that it is communicating between itself as well as those who inhabit it in an ongoing dialogue determined by accretive modification, intentional intervention, and minor detail adjustment. We'll also introduce a different idea as to orientation that relies on the memory of physical landmarks and recognizing unique relationships between an incremental part and its larger, not quite comprehensible whole. Rome too is a form of cumulative knowledge and with it, each student can build a bridge back to what they already know. The studio begins with an exercise to examine the city fabric through an experiential comparison of John Battista Noli's grand plan of Rome. The intention is to probe a segment of this plan so as to fully understand its relationships historically and in the present and to embed into its representation specific associative memories. It puts the experience of the city into a direct relationship with Noli's representation of the city. What the student finds is different from what Noli recorded. And so the process starts with determining and documenting where the plan remains the same, where it has been altered and where it no longer exists at all. So here's the plan divided into sections that are passed out to the students. Students must physically inspect, measure, and then graphically analyze their segment of urban fabric. They're chunk of it, so to speak, uh, in its first, it's, it is first identified in the context of the larger plan, then isolated from the plan, and then modified to its contemporary state physically and spatially. With this new revised segment, the characteristics of the public space with it are interrogated, its figure, ground relationships, its accessibility, its porosity as an aggregation of overlaid paths or routes through. Various, uh, the various paths or spatial sequences can then be documented as well. The result is a better understanding of how to, of, as to how the fabric establishes certain interconnections and dependencies between smaller localized moments and the larger whole. The second part of the exercise is the more challenging speculative phase. The analyzed segment of fabric is to be broken down, disassembled as it were, and then transformed, uh, reassembled according to different priorities. A series of prompts is offered as, possible, as a possible guideline for the manipulation of the segmented parts. Reorientation, deletion, 
concentration, addition, duplication, altering scale, altering proportion, reshaping. The result is that each student will produce a catalog of foreign but familiar city plan fragments. I can liken these to William Marlowe's St. Paul's and a Venetian Canal or to Canaletto's more well-known Capriccio. Neither are actual places, but they trigger a sense of familiarity. Aldo Rossi, of course, utilized Canaletto's image to articulate his idea of the analogous city in his architecture of the city. Yes, somehow we do know these places. The pedagogy offers a way to design with urban fabric, something completely outside of at least our students' vocabulary, and in the process come to terms with the value of shaped urban space and thinking of the public realm first. Multiple solutions require a comparative analogy between them, naming them, understanding their critical characteristics. And while it is of course an exercise that is performed graphically, the intrinsic experiential knowledge that each part carries with it helps to compress the difference between the actual and its double. Although not specifically intended by the lesson, a tangent to the work is recognizing that certain fictional city fragments can carry the spatial attributes of other actual cities or projects for actual cities, a distinction that can open up research um, to even deeper historical connections. As this is a design studio, uh, or as this is design studio-based research, there will also be a proposal to introduce a contemporary structure into Rome's historic fabric. Three different sites have been delineated that offer not dissimilar opportunities. The Piazza Aracelli, the Via al Mar leading to the Theater of Marcellus, and the Via della Consolazione. All register as less than defined voids, empty spaces absent a more traditional figural definition. They were each created by being cleared during the fascist period and thus are characterized by a certain unfinished or unresolved quality that points to the symbolic and polemical value of demolition rather than the, the resultant urban configuration. For these sites, the studio has prescribed a complex large scale program, a hybrid problem that brings together city, state and church requirements centered on topics of exhibition, lodging, performance and tourism. As such, it's a problem that cannot be resolved typologically and thus must orient toward combinatory thinking. The intention is that the student engage the design process as they have that initial exercise, as a puzzle of interconnected parts. The different parts go together to form a larger whole and still differently address their localized contexts. This project uh, uh, by uh, Charlotte Parsons uh, in my mind is uh, exemplary relative to the pedagogy by proposing three different pieces of fabric, each of which can act as a porous infill and modulate the pedestrian trajectory from Castle San Angelo to Piazza San Pietro as a sequence of accessible courtyards or piazza. Another project for the site introduces a similar infill while proposing a modular code that forms its basic increment. And a third proposal uses a regulating grid as a starting point, but then is adjusted and repositioned relative to more localized relationships. To research and consider such strategies of assemblage and joinery is to re-examine and reflect upon the experience of the city itself. Rome's urban body was once the composite building writ large. This project in one sense seeks to act as a restorative measure, yet without compromising the contemporary sensibility of the, the student's Brooklyn-based core education. I realize, I, uh, I realize and acknowledge that these works can open up questions of appropriateness, but it's important to understand that the Brooklyn and Rome studio is a laboratory in which American students are being exposed to the sensitivities and profound significances of a site for the very first time. The hope is that this site will ultimately become their every site. I also I also like to think that embedded within the pedagogy is the opportunity for a student to come to terms with another possibility, being a contributor to something much larger than themselves. This, this realization will hold even greater significance for where they may 
go next, because the desire to be unique in one's work and to achieve a claim for being unique has now been put into a relationship with what might be necessary to improve and contribute to the public good. And with this idea of civic good comes a different responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Frederick. It was a very interesting process. I, I suppose, how long did it take? Let me keep this question for <laughs> after the presentations. And uh, just, just don't forget that <laughs> I paused already. Okay. okay, so the final presentation is going to be quite interesting and quite following the topic, the role of elliptical squares in urban morphology, the case of Piazza del Popolo and Piazza San Pietro in Rome. So, um, okay, let me <laughs> introduce, to you, uh, introduce you our presenter, uh, Jiayu Jing. Is it correctly co pronounced? I'm not sure, it help me out. Uh, she is a postgraduate student in Sapienza University of Rome, mastering in architectural conservation. She is a winner of MAECI grants by the Italian government and a member of Ecomos China. She holds the master's degree of architectural design and history in Nanjing University and implemented several restoration projects in China. Her main studies are focusing on the historical city, urban morphology and conservation theories. So the stage is yours. Thank you. I will share is the screen. Okay, thank you. Thank you very no, much you. for the introduction. And today our presentation will be with me and also my um, friends, Philip, that he will start our presentation first. Okay, so uh, as my friend Jiao introduced, our work is uh, titled uh, The Role of Over Squares in Urban Morphology, uh, Piazza, San Pietro, Piazza San Pietro and Piazza del Popolo in Rome. So our main goal as first was to, to analyze Piazza del Popolo's main features and its role in the city, but it was inevitable, of course, due to its importance and characteristics uh, and especially for its shape to confront and compare it uh, a little bit with Piazza San Pietro. Uh, and also understanding that this is uh, an ongoing research we are developing and we may not have uh, all answers, but we're indeed on the way to find uh, them. So you can go next. So uh, just giving a general introduction, squares as we know are usually the meeting place, uh, stage of religious and civic meetings. A uh, site that has uh, that performs several functions and are generally the most important places in cities and thus concentrate uh, their most distinctive and refined architecture. So, uh, being irregular or not, since ancient times, uh, squares were usually uh, morphologically defined and also visually delimited by facade surfaces or other elements such as colonnades that enclose it. Uh, so, like this oval form, for example, in Jordan. And it's important to note that uh, despite this, this example shown in the picture, and for example, plans of ancient amphitheaters that we see in old plans, in old city plans, uh, oval shape is very unusual and difficult to find uh, on urban morphology, especially in squares. So we can go next. Uh, the point is that squares can play different roles in cities. Uh, it may be the starting point of a location with a strong symbolic meaning, as it was in the Roman castrum, for example, uh, and also can mark the geographic center of a city as it was for many Hispanic American cities uh, created with a rigid grid, the so-called uh, Damero. But it also may be a nodal point for a city, a pole to which movement converge. And it is during the Renaissance and the Baroque period that many of the squares uh, that we experience uh, in the contemporary world will receive a good part of its still existing structure. And inscribed in this context are the two spaces that we have as object of study in this work. Uh, both of them transformed during those, those periods. So Piazza San Pietro, one of the most unique and explained uh, examples of Baroque Rome, uh, began to change when 
the architect Bramante proposed a, a Greek cross plan for, for the reconstruction of St. Peter's Church, uh, as we can see uh, bolder in the picture. Uh, after his death, as we know, other artists will change his initial project, such as Raffaello, Antonio da Sangalo, Carlo Maderno, and also Michelangelo. And the nave, uh, as we can also see in the plan, was enlarged uh, regarding the initial project. Uh, next. So uh, this enlargement of the nave responsible for retake the basilical shape uh, to the church will, will reduce the dome's magnificence as already addressed by many authors, uh, directing the eyes towards the facade and when very close to it, even hiding the dome, as we can see in the picture. Uh, as I said, many scholars have already addressed this issue and it's not our goal to rewrite it, let's say, but it's important to understand that this, uh, to understand these historical processes as it will definitely impact the design of the new square. So about that, uh, according to, to Dorot Hebel, uh, Pope Alexander VII, that was the responsible for undertaking the new square construction, uh, he intended at first to create a square that was primarily ornamental and not utilitarian. And his words to replace this old square we can see in the picture. Uh, the obelisk is already there. It's a drawing from the uh, 17th century, 1641. Uh, Domenico Fontana put the obelisk there, but the square is still very... Uh, irregular, as we can see in this other other picture, this this uh, drawing by Tempesta. So uh, you can go next. So in this sense, Hebel affirmed that the, the pontiff Alexander VII noted some parameters for the new square in his diary, which included a trapezoidal shape, a one-story limit, and a decorative ornamentation uh, with statues. Uh, Bernini himself even proposes initially a, tra a trapezoidal plan, as you can see in these early schemes. Uh, but then one year after the announcement, the oval shape, uh, the ellipse, was presented and greatly appreciated by the Pope. And in the right, we can see the overlap of the old basilica and the new building with the new square that was uh, extended by Bernini, moved towards uh, the obelisk. That's a little bit far from the from church facade. Uh, next. So the shape of, of this new square uh, emerged as already explored by some autos, also from the strategy of rescuing the expression of the dome. So Bernini masterfully resolves it, directing the passerby to the focal point, uh, inducing uh, the view of the dome that he made possible by extending the square uh, towards the obelisk. So as we can see in this next picture, uh, in this one, uh, the dome reappeared uh, on the church composition. Uh, and also, we can go next. We can see in this view near the, 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 the focal points that uh, the view of the dome was brought back uh, to the square. So, Rudolf Wittkauer uh, affirms that would be necessary for the square also, not uh, to reflect not only the function it was supposed to perform, but also to accommodate the greatest possible number of people. So in order, in order to attend all of these questions, uh, and if does not recover, but at least somehow revalue the dome, uh, is that Bernini proposes the most known possibly oval shaped square that is definitely inserted in Roma's uh, urban structure. So, but you can go next. Uh, but more than that, uh, Bernini inserts this structure in total consonance with, with the intricate fabric of the Borghi, the old neighborhood, uh, taking advantage of, of its narrow streets to create the, his, his masterful entrance to St. Peter's Square. And uh, to finish this section, you can go next. Uh, we cannot fail to mention uh, that, as everyone knows, that, that such an arrangement was lost in the, in the 20th century with the demolition of the Borghi to create Via della Conciliazione. Uh, and this, this, this uh, intervention not only sacrifices the idea of, of the enclosed square, square taught by Bernini, but also uh, dismantles the direction uh, of the accesses. Okay. So our second case study is the Piazza del Popolo, which reference draws on the oval shape of Piazza 
on San Pietro. Before the 19th century tra transformation, the piazza has a trapezoid shape, and Piazza del Popolo is located in the Campomazzo area. It was the important north entrance of the city. Through the Porta Popolo, which was called Porta Flaminia, the Via Flaminia connected Rome to Limini. Therefore, when travelers arrive Rome from the north, they enter the Porta Flaminia, they have the image of the Rome right at the point of Piazza del Popolo. This part of the Campo Mazzo began to be urbanized only towards the middle of the 16th century. At this time, Piazza del Popolo still has the trapezoid shape, which we can see in many historical documents. And during this period, three big transformations happened in this area. First is the obelisk and fountain located in the center of the piazza. The first fountain in the center of the piazza was built as early as 1572, based on a project by Giacomo della Porta. In 1589, the obelisk was raised beside the fountain by Pope Sixtus V. This action is under his urban plan for Rome, which aimed to connecting the seven churches and totally change the urban spaces in Rome. The obelisk of Santa Maria del Popolo was one of the four obelisks implanted by Sixtus V, and it is also the last one be raised, which marked the confluence of three main roads and converted the Piazza del Popolo into a real urban pole. Another thing uh, of the transformation is the Trident Road during 15th and 17th centuries. The 16th century's intervention rearranged the three trees that from Porta del Popolo conveyed traffic to the major basilicas. The ideas of Trident Road as cost of road in his book, it was firstly applied to Rome and spread to Versailles, St. Petersburg, and Old Chicago. The third big transformation is the construction of the twin churches. In the 17th century, Pope Alexander VII wanted to create a focal point that would attract the attention of all those who pass through the Piazza del Popolo. The architect Linaldi had to deal with the fact that the wages of the end of the trident is not symmetrical. The available space on the left was smaller than the space on the right. So the problem was solved by equipping Santa Maria de Milacoli, which is on the left, with the oval plan, and the Santa Maria in Montesano with a circle plan on the right, that we can see clearly in Nolly's map. The two churches has different size in the cupola as well. However, in the frontal view, for a particular optical effect, the twin churches would definitely present the same weights, suggesting an illusion that the two churches were exactly the same. We also could understand this north and south axis is dominate one of Piazza del Popolo in Baroque period. Therefore, even the square without an oval shape, all the Baroque characters were clearly demonstrated here. For Baroque period of Rome, the important thing was what can be perceived and seen instead of objective reality of the facts. So the things offered the spectators acting as essential elements of the Baroque ideology propaganda through the theatrical appeal to fantasy, imagination, and illusion. The urban space then consequently be transformed into a dramatic theater, and the city is a sequence of scenographic images. However, in the 19th century, another design ideology was overlapped in this piazza. During 1809 to 1814, it's a Napoleonic period of Rome, and many activities were carried out in order to embellish Rome. With the idea of Garden of Great Kaiser, one promenade was designed on the hill of Pincho. The interpretation between architecture and landscape, as well as a big scale of urban project, is a main design ideology in this period. Before the oval shaped proposal for Piazza del Popolo, we found Giuseppe Valandia proposed another design in 1793. We can see that the trapezoid shape or the fernal shape is still kept in and enhanced in this proposal. Valandia proposed a serial facade with continuous colonnade, which also aims to strengthen the north-south axis and enhance the perspective. The intention is clearly showed in his proposal, which was abandoned later. The oval shape of Piazza del Popolo started to form from Valandia's second project, which has influenced by the French architect Francese, who was sent to Rome by the Napoleon government. The French architect criticized the Roman design was too focused on a single place and lost the bigger urban perspective. 
and he suggests an oval shape with clear reference to San Piazza San Pietro. The French solution was fully accepted by Valandier later, and he adapted this idea, making a monumental continuity between city and the gates become more organic. Through this project, the west-east axis is formed, which is a pincho tablet axis. Um, yes. And also we can see that uh, the Valandier formed the oval shape of the piazza with four circles and the fountain in the middle. In the 19th century, the design ideology behind urban form already very different from the Baroque period. Even with a similar oval shape, the main feature is not illusion and scenographic anymore. Instead, the landscape design within a grand urban project become prominent. In this way, the dominant axis could naturally redirect itself to the Tavile Pincho direction, which is its green axis, and the celebrating axis to the hill with the new gardens. As a consequence, the former unique axis from the north to south become a bit ambiguous, and it weakened the pre existing um, Baroque conceptions. Because when people now enter the piazza nowadays, there is no focal point, and the light of sight is not clearly directed. So our next part is about the comparisons between these two cases. First, is if we compare the scale of Piazza del, um, Piazza del Popolo with Piazza San Pietro, Piazza San Pietro is much bigger than the Piazza del Popolo. However, when people stand inside the piazza, the sense of boundary and embracement of Piazza San Pietro is much stronger than Piazza San, um, del Popolo. Bernini's correlate play with the perception that people can feel the dynamic when they move inside the piazza. Second is the geometry. As we know, in Renaissance period, the circle as the perfect shape is widely used. Architects started the mathematic understanding of oval shape and the great architects of Baroque were influenced by the astronomic new series like Kepler and they become fascinated by the oval shape because different from the circle, an oval shape has two centers with a major axis and a minor axis. Therefore, unlike from the center of the circle to any direction is equal, the oval shape provides a dynamic and unequal quality to different directions. If we look carefully with Valandia's draw drawing in the right, he didn't use two circles to form the uh, oval. Instead, there are four circles which are not sharing a same center. The boundary of the piazza seems an offset of the two of the um, four circles. In addition, the lateral um, boundary of the um, piazza looks like a straight lines instead of oval. Therefore, we think this shape of Piazza del Popolo, strictly speaking, is hardly to be called an oval shape. Thirdly, uh, if we compare the perspective in these two piazza, it's very different. As we explained before, the oval shape of Piazza del Popolo proposed in 19th century might weaken the Baroque culture of the square by adding another dominant axis towards Pincho and Devile. So a scholar proposed another solution for this piazza, still using the oval shape, but putting the major axis towards the north-south Baroque axis. In this way, the scale of the oval shape might be smaller, but provide the possibility of enhance its Baroque features. We can see from the diagrams, the blue line shows the visible rage that when people enter the city gate. So when the oval shape rotated uh, in a new way, the perspective and angle is very different because the visible rage is narrower and more corresponded to the ex existing trident. And within the major axis, placing at north and south, the depth of the space and the perspective along this axis is stronger. Which in the case of Piazza San Pietro, uh, we think like Bernini designed the colonnade at the end of the major axis, while the facade of the basilica to the minor axis of the oval. In this way, when people stand on the center of the circular arc of the colonnade, where all the normal lines meet and the four columns on each row are aligned, Therefore, uh, the people can only see one column for each row and feel the colonnade is permeable in this way. And the, rep the placement of the oval shape is the only way to achieve such a dynamic perspective. Because if we think the oval shape placed in another way, if we rotate in the um, Piazza San Pietro, we might get 
we might got, got an advantage that the distance to the basilica would be longer and the people might have a better perception of the dome. However, the dynamic of the changing perception towards the colonnade will be lost. Therefore, we believe that the geometry of the oval shape has to be fully understood and connected to the design ideology behind so that urban form could help to shape the movement and dynamic inside of the city. So uh, in order to, to finish, uh, since the Renaissance, as, as Jael said, with the development of mathematical studies and skills, uh, circular shape appears, appears as, a, as a very important figure, uh, especially on those, in those plans of ideal cities. And in Baroque period, the oval shape due to its movement and death will take on a, a prominent role, especially in architecture. It was widely used in some churches and domes, for example. Uh, however, despite the shape's visual strength, uh, its use proves to be very uncommon, as I said, in urban spaces. And in addition to the, the comparisons shown, uh, it's important to consider that regarding St. Peter, its shape answers, answers a varied number of questions. So at the same time that the space's meaning is described as an allegory of the Christian church embracing the Christians and the world, uh, its form comes up from multiple strategies as already uh, described. It has a, a very strong symbolic meaning. It, it performs uh, a clear function, but also contributes to enhance the perception of the church. On the other hand, uh, Piazza del Popolo has a very different, different connection with, with the city, a reflection of the uh, Napoleonic influences in the 19th century that actually dismantled the Baroque space uh, using, of course, the same, almost the same shape because they are a little bit different, but with very different uh, intentions and without creating uh, deeper relations with the city. Uh, so while in San Pietro, the oval shape is very representative, strong, uh, and very well connected with, the, with Baroque design intentions of the 17th century, in Piazza del Popolo, uh, despite the clear connection between them, it answers very different ideological questions and, and design intentions, failing to perform a, a very relevant role. So that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for this nice presentation. So I suppose um, now we can get, we can start um, our 15 minutes discussion period, we can get the questions so far. Okay, we have, I think, okay, we have, okay, my, my question was, my first question was at least coming to uh, Frederick at how long was that study taking place for the city of Rome and the uh, practice and the city as the lab, it, it looked quite interesting and, and exciting, I have to say, especially in the time of this um, digital tools and, you know, uh, spending uh, studios online. So how was that working, especially how is it working at this moment? Sure, I can, I can answer that. Um, I, ha I have to say that, you know, it, it, as I mentioned, it's a design studio. And the irony for me is that the actual, the greater interest is actually in the introductory exercise to the design studio. So seeing the, the I show the ultimate results of the, of the process as, you know, because it's really a, a kind of a, a critical application then of what has been learned, but sort of examining these sort of fictional fragments is uh, absolutely fascinating for me. Um, it's, it's, it's basically a one month, it, it's one month is probably more time than is absolutely necessary. So it's a two, it's a two, because of all the sort of back and forth into the side and the, sort of, you know, sort of collecting material, the first phase, which is really a kind of observation, analysis, measurement, and documentation that takes two weeks. And then the speculative phase, once that's done, probably could be reduced to three sessions uh, of a class. Uh, our classes meet twice a week. So that, you know, is typically translates into two weeks. So, so it's the first month, uh, of a semester. And then the problem takes up the, the remainder of the semester. Okay. Thank you. So, um, let me summarize at least the presentations, maybe all Kunda Yul's presentation and the nation building, according to my own notes, symbols and architecture and policy, policies for Turkism, let's say, um, uh, a movement from 
calling me Mark or the architect, even with the architectural linguistics and even in, in the social and, and uh, political um, terminologies changing. Komal was, was mentioning about the eidetic mapping. The, I mean, I was in the very beginning, I was thinking about what, how would it be related to the sense of, uh, sensitive development of the sense of places, but like it obviously was um, was documenting the drivers of change and the potential for a more inclusive design. Uh, Moan City presentation of um, Bechetoal and ah, sorry, and uh, let me sorry, sorry, never. Um, uh, so um, the Ma'an city was, as a, as a crossroad, it was obviously having the heritage at risk and how to actually save or how to reuse these structures, this uh, architectural practices as well through, um, through the daily practices or through the reality of, of the nature. And um, <laughs> sorry for like, you know, I was <laughs> enthusiastic in the question. Frederick was was uh, Frederick Bieler was was um, presenting the actual and its double the puzzle of the city. It was a pedagogic approach attribution to design studio. It was um, obviously playing with the architecture as a language, was uh, as an alternative, an experimental language. And the final presentation from uh, Piazza del Popolo and and um, sorry again the. I keep, yeah, I, I, I have to, I have to practice Italian, I suppose, that Piazza San Pietro, uh, the perception versus reality was, was quite interesting. I mean, the symbolic meanings and the design attitudes and, and the perceived um, spaces, uh, spaces of propaganda was, was, I think, quite interesting for, at least for my side, for the terms of city connectivity and a perceived environment. So um, we had some uh, remarks, I suppose, in terms of Noli map as an artifact from uh, Alessandro Camis, uh, that he was mentioning that at the chat box. It's not, it's not a comma, it's just, you know, the, the online version of the Noli map, which, I mean, yeah, yeah, it would be quite useful. And, and another uh, and another remark was for Massimo Brindelli's La Machina Heroica. Was it? Yes, I mean, I mean, this one of the plans shown there comes from that book. I think he should be listed. Um, you know, he explained very much in detail the whole uh, design process of Piazza San Pietro by he was my professor, so. <laughs> I know exactly his lectures. I, I do remember besides the book, so I think you should take a look at his publication if you haven't read it. Um, now I was saying, uh, Fred, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, it is interesting how, I mean, besides the paper of the, of the map, you know, that you're playing with, uh, it is interesting how students are playing with, with urban tissues. They're composing fragments of, of a map, yes, but those are buildings, the, not, not even buildings. Uh, blocks right and that is something that is very interesting for me so i do appreciate the the, the whole thing uh, let's see if we can do something together in the future in rome we have the summer school program so that could be one one chance mm -hmm. absolutely i think we have one more message at the chat box uh from neil buras Shall I, shall I read the question? Okay, I'm reading the question uh, for, again, for uh, Frederick Pele. Do, do the students actually learn the orders? Um, I think I, I, what I mentioned at toward the end was that, um, you know, these, these, this is not a neoclassical program. I know there are certain um, schools in the United States that come to Rome and they use you know, they have, a, they have an entire curriculum that's based around a kind of neoclassical. In fact, I, I think Catholic University has recently just adopted that as a, uh, as a new sort of 
idea. Uh, University of Notre Dame um, has for quite some time now had a neoclassical program and that's not Pratt. Pratt Institute is uh, in Brooklyn. It's, it's an architecture program that's in an art school. It is a, it is a school of design that like takes great pride in its sort of cutting edge thinking when it comes to pushing the envelope on design and doing the most radical things. And so that's why I kind of say that this program is like a bomb exploding. It's, 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 you also have to sort of think about, think about they've, students have studied for three and a half years when they come and they have had this particular kind of core education. And this is just an absolute confrontation for them in every way. Um, and, and so, no, the, the point of the program is really to sort of think more about urban form itself, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a kind of, and as an idea, idea of integrating, being able to integrate within contexts. Um, so there, there really isn't, uh, too much sort of evaluation of the classical system that's happening in this program at all. It's really about sort of morphology. Okay. So, I think we have two more questions from Jan. Jan, uh, I think Mar Martin was first. Martin was first. Okay, sorry, my mistake. Okay, no, it, then it, Martin. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm not having actually a question. I just want to thank uh, uh, Frederick for his lecture because it was very inspiring. Um, uh, teaching students, I have a course. Uh, for first and second year students, uh, form, space, order, color. And uh, these kind of uh, exercises, are, that I was very inspired and I hope uh, you don't mind if I'm gonna rip off some of your ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's exactly what I was uh, writing to Fred <laughs> afterwards. It's like a manifesto. Um, and, uh, you know, I know Fred, because I do some lectures for his students when they come to Rome. And for me, it's also always a great experience. I admit that I'm a fairly, I'm fairly conservative when it comes down to, you know, what I understand architecture, what I understand as history and so. And it's also, it's for me a very enriching to be confronted with his students who have this completely different from they are and, and uh, talk about architecture and I've always so always found um, a great response. You can contradict me if, it's, if I'm wrong, Fred, but there's a great response also from the students to um, to for instance and that when a project is at the end of the semester, I do not understand anything. Um, of what I'm looking at, but um, but it's great to have them then to hear them explain uh, um, how they got to their uh, final designs and uh, how that actually even how that fits in and how their stay in Rome has uh, helped them, you know, also broaden, widen, and deepen uh, their knowledge. So, uh, but yeah, I think what uh, the way Fred explained is really like a kind of a manifesto, and it shows that even the most radical approach to architecture can find in the most, uh, let's say, historical of cities, uh, an encounter from where that is. I think that that is exactly the point, right? I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just say to follow up on that, yeah, I don't know if anybody noticed, but Jan was actually in one of the photographs in the presentation. <laughs> explaining a particular site. And, you know, our program is actually quite old. It's going to be 50 years old uh, uh, next year. And um, so it's really one of the one of the longest running programs in Rome. And, but uh, when it started, there were very few and now there are very many. Uh, there are many, many programs uh, from North America that come to Rome, spend time there. And you know, so I've just I've just had the I've had been very lucky to have the opportunity to sort of think 
uh, about how to fully take advantage of this uh, sort of experience for the students. And um, this, is the, this is the second pedagogy that was developed and we've been running it now for about almost, uh, it'll be 10 years next year, actually. Uh, and so we use the pedagogy, we revised the program a little bit, but the learning from the Noli program has been the, sort of the critical component to it. Um, but we, um, you know, in fact, Jan is one of the critics who says, when are we going to stop doing that and do something different? And uh, <laughs> I think we're going to change to a different uh, pedagogy next year, actually. So thank you. I think Martin, Martin has another question. Well, I, I just want to add, because I, I think I think our students are very good with the visual concepts. They they have very fast pictures and ideas about what they want to do and which way they want to go, but um, they, they lack often the conceptual thinking, uh, thinking in concepts and understanding the, the uh, that even urban tissue can have a a um, uh, what do you call it a surface uh, um, a certain uh, um, a certain touchability on the uh, on the on the drawing. So so now I think that gives this this gives this um, uh, this um, it gives it, for conceptual thinking. I think your your approach is very is very uh, is very good. So I, I think uh, this this was very inspiring. Thank you again. Um, I had actually a question in terms of Jaffa and Man City in um, related to the um, actual and double practice for the case of Rome. How would the city of Jaffa and the explorations for new approaches after this all the layers of, of reading through the timeline that you did come out, um, do you think this kind of approach would actually create a complete new exploration for new designs or uh, transformations for the city? Yes, um, thank you, Demet, for the question. Um, actually, the purpose of this entire mapping is not um, to directly inform new approaches, but to capture information that has been lost or has not been captured. Because Israel is this um, conflicting society between the Arabs and the Jews. Mm -hmm. And if we actually um, look into the municipality, the decision making processes, uh, there is this cognitive division in also uh, the decisions or the new programs or the planning that is proposed. So this is like a, an experiment to no, not um, ignore the political nuances, but without being political, I would say, to bring on paper the realities, because there is a lot of um, liminalities between the two uh, communities. And both need to be addressed because both are uh, both have the history and cultural narratives and identities. So there's a lot of conflict, and I think Jaffa is now also witnessing a lot of demographic shifts, gentrification due to the tourism. So unless all these layers are identified, so this this is like the first step of identification, which is very important because right now it's not identified, and uh, if it's this process of identification is embedded in the system. Then the planning can be um, uh, can uh, can adopt new practices. So that's the whole aim of this, and that's why I take help of the historic urban landscape approach or even the new urban agenda because a lot of these attributes. So there are policy guidelines which are broad, but it's not detailed, or maybe um, the detailing of attributes is not done of how to practice these uh, targets or indicators. So this is a way to develop the method which can be adopted in the municipalities or urban local bodies. I see, I will, okay, I will write you an email <laughs> questioning okay. this more afterwards. Definitely. But this uh, division, the cognitive division, it is quite powerful as far as I know, but um, I am usually having a mindset of like, you know, how to transform the whole situation and to, to create a sort of a more experimental way of our or experimental approach in order to create a sort of a, um, interaction potential. So that was actually the case for Maan City, for instance, that um, I realized that through the, through the, also the abstract, but also through your presentations that you were focusing on, on the 
daily practices, on the current practices, that how people were in fact taking uh, or considering the heritage at risk or, or they are using the heritage at risk according to their daily practices. So uh, how to balance the things and how this, this sort of interaction can, uh, can have a potential for a further development or preservation. Actually, it's quite difficult because um, on, on one hand, people really like these uh, remains of heritage, uh, this, this um, strong heritage, but on the other hand, they really don't know how to live with it right now. Um, there is lacking of um, knowledge about how to reuse this type of buildings. So this is really typically the type of place where you need to do a lot of intervention and uh, to communicate a lot uh, locally with people. And also where you need to um, work with them in order to build a um, local project on it because um, they are the only one who can actually um, be able to preserve it. But um, they are lacking of a lot of uh, knowledge about it. So that's, that's the, the first point. And um, if the work we are doing can help uh, to give more awareness about that and give the local people more key about how to reuse. And um, we, we only present today the, the context because we, we thought uh, not a lot of people know about man <laughs> need to present the city. But um, um, I, um, there is a lot of uh, program that can be um, done in man in order to, uh, to implement um, this. Okay, thank you. Um, I also wonder if Frederick was, um, as a focal um, research area, let's say, the Piazza del Popolo, <laughs> within the within the context of research, and if if if, for instance, the final presentation group, I mean, if they would be in in charge of of transforming or, or, or touching the ground again on, on the city of Rome, that how would they, they treat the city? It would be quite interesting, or at least their research areas. Well, um, I, I think that um, the kind of uh, more subtle uh, message in the actual architectural design problem was the selection of site, it came with the selection of site. So obviously there was an overlap between the sort of examination of the Piazza San Pietro and the adjacent fabric and the problem that we were engaged with. And all of the sites that we are, have always selected for the studio are uh, open spaces that were cleared um, as part of the regulating plan during the fascist period. Um, so there's, even though it's not explicitly ex sort of discussed outright, there's a kind of implicit criticism or critique of that um, exercise, uh, which has left the city in its current, in, which has really defined the city more, more broadly in its current state because the, you know, the pieces of Noli's uh, fabric is more like an archipelago than it is you know, a co cohesive city. And so in many ways, the, the problem has found a site that now uh, attempts to stitch together the fabric that remains uh, through this contemporary intervention. Um, the idea of proposing something for a Piazza del Popolo would be outside of that, right? It would be, um, it would be let's say inappropriate to do uh, if one is following that same line of criticism uh, for the selection of the site of the sites for the, for where and how to build, right? And as I mentioned, I mentioned that that in, when dealing with the the sort of fascist era spaces within the city, one always I think is confronted by something that's not 
quite right or not quite finished or they're, they're in, intrinsically problematic uh, in, in, a, in many different ways. And so, it, and so it makes sense for the sort of uh, studio then to sort of be attempting to, to recuperate uh, in, in the face of that. So, okay. but, there were, but there were great overlaps between the fabric at the Piazza San Pietro. In fact, we had Alan Seen gives us his, uh, uh, his, his whole uh, sort of uh, body of research uh, on that whole area. And it's, it's uh, quite fantastic. The uh, Via Nuovo there and the, the alignment with uh, Bernini's arm and the, the way in which that fact, Alan Seen doesn't like our projects at all, by the way, because uh, Alan Seen believes that we should simply reconstruct Nolly's plan, and that's it. There is no other way to do it. You know, there's no no room for anything in a contemporary way here. It's just only reconstructing Nolly's plan. But uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you for this very nice um, um, discussion. Session, yeah. Thank you. And and we have now we're moving towards the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Demet Mutman and Ezgi Cicek. The next Thank session, Thank the you. next session will be chaired uh, by uh, Sinan Burat from Mersin University and myself from Özyen University. Sinan Hocam, hello, welcome. So, uh, I'm going to share the session, but uh, meanwhile, I would like to uh, ask to Sinan Burat to briefly introduce himself. Meanwhile. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Sinan. Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm a landscape architect, actually. Uh, I have my master's on urban design and uh, PhD on um, city planning. Um, I've been teaching at Mercer University City and Regional Planning Department for the past 10 years. Uh, and my main fields of interest are urban green spaces uh, and uh, how um, uh, we should be shaping them uh, in the face of climate crisis uh, or reshaping them in the, in the face of climate crisis. Uh, and um, I think uh, Zeynep Ceylan should also uh, introduce herself. Uh, thank you, Sinan Hocam. I'm Zeynep Ceydanlı from Özgün University from Interior Architecture and Environmental Design Department. Uh, so um, maybe uh, if Sinan Hocam uh, is okay, we can uh, proceed uh, with our um, um, session entitled with Climate Crisis, COVID-19 Crisis, Migration, Cities and Cultural Heritage. Mm -hmm. So the we should first... Yeah, we should also first. remind that, uh, uh, that each presenter has uh, about 20 minutes, right? Yes, correct. Um, we will have uh, two minutes and one minute uh, warnings for them. Yes. Uh, Sinan Hocam, you see my screen, right? Yep, I do. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. So would you like to present the first uh, yes. paper? The the first uh, presentation is uh, will be done by uh, the uh, after the damages uh, training project uh, attendees. Uh, I believe Marcello Bazzani is here with us, if I'm correct. And uh, no, the speaker will be Fabiana Ranco and Mario Montuori from the Department of Architecture of the University of Ferrara. Good afternoon, okay. everybody. Pardon me, pardon no. me. Fabiana and uh, Mario will be here, uh, are here with us. Uh, they, the, their um, presentation is titled Built Environment and Cultural Heritage Identity and Preservation. Uh, uh, they will be presenting uh, the three-year advanced training uh, project, uh, and I leave the stage to them. Thank you very much. I will share the screen. Uh, 
Do you see it? Is it? Not, not yet. Not yet. No. Not yet. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be uh, here today uh, on behalf of all the authors uh, with a colleague of mine, Maglio Montuari, in order to briefly present to you um, first results of this uh, international uh, project, which is, uh, um, first of all, uh, uh, a project of higher education, but also a project, uh, um, a research project, which uh, involves uh, several uh, um, national and both international partners among universities, research centers, and also public administration. Mm -hmm. Environment and cultural heritage identity and preservation is the main topic of the summer school after damages, which is um, a project founded under the Emilia Romagna region funds uh, for higher education, and which is uh, strictly in relation to the uh, smart specialization strategy of the, our region and also of the European regions. Uh, for, um, for this reason, our partners, uh, main partners, are um, uh, at the same time, University of Ferrara, but also University of Parma, Department of Architecture and Engineer, University of Modena and Reggio Emilia, Department of Engineer, and also the Ministry of Cultural and Heritage, as well as the Agency for Reconstruction 2012, which is a public agency uh, funded after the Emilia Romagna earthquake in 2012 as well. At the same time, the, the main topic and also the output of the project are strictly linked to an international project, which is a cooperation transnational project interreg fire spill, uh, which uh, aims to provide uh, among uh, primarily among public institutions. Uh, institutions, uh, uh, regions, uh, and so and also countries, uh, some strategies and tools in order to harmonize. We can say um, the the approach to the uh, emergency phase after uh, damages, uh, several type of damages, and also the phase of reconstruction. Uh, on the other hand, we have a lot of uh, um, both. Uh, public-private association which, which uh, are engaged in the project. One of these is the Cluster Build, which is a public-private association born in Emilia-Romagna region, and uh, also the associ Association of Professionals, and, as well as uh, some other uh, well-known as um, the Green Building Council Italia. Uh, the structure of the... Um, and which is also the strategy of the project, um, refers to um, the representatives of the main institutions involved, uh, as you can see here, which uh, uh, are both research uh, uh, institutes and also public administration. But uh, uh, we can also add it that, uh, add, we can also add it that uh, since it's uh, origin, the International um, Summer School and also Academy after the damages has opened uh, to international partners. Uh, this is, uh, um, this aspect, it's uh, of the main importance in order to transfer um, the consideration, the, the knowledge we can provide at the regional or national level as an ecosystem, we can say, to other situation in order to compare them. We know very well that uh, the approach to build heritage as well as to cultural heritage is quite different uh, with respect to different uh, ecosystem territories, countries, and so on, uh, from different point of view, from governance point of view, from management point of view, and also from uh, the point of view of, of tools, techniques, uh, uh, specialties involved. And, and so this is uh, one of the main uh, um, aims of the 
of the international project uh, to uh, compare in order to transfer different experiences and different approaches. Uh, the International Summer School is um, the International Academy is uh, based on a strategies, as I mentioned, uh, the European Smart Specialization Strategy uh, is uh, the basis of our framework in order to support, in order to be um, active actor, uh, in order to support uh, the ecosystem of research um, companies and also professionals involved in this type of fields. Main aims of the, of the project uh, are here listed. Uh, the first one, provide guidance, material, good, good practices, examples. So we start from this type of activities also during the training activities. Uh, inform strategy formation and policy making. Uh, the aspect of governance is uh, uh, always uh, um, uh, to be uh, is always uh, considered during the um, the training activities facilitate peer reviews and mutual learning support access to relevant data train professional and policy maker and as well as define research and developer trajectories and objectives in order to uh, develop a transnational projects uh, after um, the, the main topic has been identified. A specific action which uh, have been put in practice uh, since the first edition, edition and in particular during this second year are training actions uh, for um, which uh, involves uh, professionals as well as expert researchers and public administration um, employees, thematic events, working groups, talks uh, in, uh, um, from a point of view, a brief speech or uh, um, talk about specific team, uh, public engagement actions, and so the involvement of a general public and dissemination of scientific knowledge. Um, as I mentioned, uh, from the point of view of the main partner involves Italian partners, uh, the starting point is uh, the experience of the Emilia Romagna earthquake in 2012, which is uh, uh, still more important from a variety of point of view. Uh, from one end, because of the huge amount of built heritage damage, damage by the earthquake, uh, a variety of uh, built heritage from cultural heritage to productive activity to uh, as well as uh, um, the historical city, small historical city centers, which are the basis of our territory. But uh, from the other end, also the strategy. Uh, which was put in practice by the Emilia-Romagna region, uh, the region Emilia-Romagna and the uh, Ministry of Cultural Heritage in order to uh, manage the emergency phase, but also the reconstruction phase uh, from a point of view of a, an integrated project. In this sense uh, was uh, realized uh, um, a sort of working group which involved uh, since the beginning, and this is was a, the, this is a, an, as, uh, an, an exceptional aspect in our um, national um, experience, which involved uh, both uh, um, professionals. Uh, public authorities from the municipalities involved by the damages, and uh, also the uh, superintendents. Uh, this type of strategies gave the uh, opportunity to uh, manage effectively uh, from, one from one hand the huge amount of money that the, uh, the national government provide uh, the Emilia-Romagna region in order to face this type of disaster, but also uh, was uh, very important in order to put in practice uh, in time each project uh, uh, of reconstruction from um, from a private hand and also from a public point of view. Some of uh, 
I, some of uh, uh, the activity, specific activities uh, which will be put in practice during the, the next year, you see uh, different uh, situation. The most important is uh, uh, the training activity during the summer in uh, July, which is uh, characterized by two weeks of intensive training activity, but also the present, uh, for instance, at the Biennale of uh, architecture in Venice, uh, as well as in, in other uh, situations such as a spring focus uh, or winter focus, which uh, are tools in order to uh, develop uh, um, a specific working group on, uh, on some subject, uh, for instance, in order to cite someone of them, uh, technology for survey techniques, uh, uh, technology for data sharing. One of the most important transversal theme of this project is uh, uh, moreover, the use of ICT technology in order to support all these type of uh, aims and scopes. Uh, the results of the first summer school, the first training activities, the participation, you, you see uh, a lot of candidates, 62 participants from uh, several nations and continents. Each uh, uh, group of students was asked to develop uh, a project work, a short project work, you know, there are mm, the training was characterized by two weeks of uh, lectures and at the end uh, a, a project group um, for, uh, and they were asked to develop uh, um, um, starting from their experiences uh, uh, some consideration strategies or also a meta project we can say uh, on one of the main topics of the summer school governance and strategies from one hand uh, survey and, techno and technology for the uh, knowledge to provide knowledge about uh, the built heritage or cultural heritage uh, as well as uh, some uh, um, tough about uh, uh, strategies and tools to support awareness of the um, of the publics uh, of the public involved during the uh, during the damages or after uh, a disaster. Uh, disaster with mm, different type of disasters from earthquake, fire, fire, and uh, also floods and so on. We, we know that uh, in relation to different countries and different situation, we can afford a several type of damages and several type of disaster. Uh, but it's quite interesting to um, to deep the knowledge about how different uh, situations and countries uh, provide uh, also competencies, uh, tools, uh, infrastructures in order to, uh, uh, to preserve their territories. And uh, now I leave the floor to a colleague of mine, Mario Montuori. Thank you, Fabiana. Good afternoon to all of you. Um, I'm just going on with the, our presentation and uh, at this stage, we can say that um, the after you know, the damages academy and its summer school, the aims are mainly focused uh, to increase the awareness in natural and anthropic hazards, and um, doing so to reduce the level of potential disasters and its impact on citizens. Uh, next, please. That, um, the, the summer school uh, was designed to be the right occasion to capitalize the experience gained uh, in the recent uh, post-disaster reconstruction by involving uh, the partners that uh, mentioned before for Fabiana, the University of Ferrara, of course, uh, the University of Modena, Regimia, and all the others uh, like the um, the regional agency for the 2012 reconstruction, the local um, uh, superintendency for uh, the Ministry of Cultural Heritage. I know that I'm going to, uh, I don't remember all the partners, but they are very, uh, it's a huge amount of partners. So, and of course, we involve an uh, interdisciplinary team of uh, Italian and uh, international experts. To, uh, due to uh, their experience in, uh, in the disaster management. 
also, um, we imagine this, this plan to highlight the recent innovations and uh, um, the advancements in the post-disaster management and uh, uh, focusing to the dissemination. We intended uh, the summer school to uh, disseminate the most updated experiences uh, to enable um, participants to play a proactive role in disaster risk, uh, in, in the management of disaster risk, and respond more, more effectively through mitigation strategies. Uh, and um, for this end, please next slide. For this uh, end, we uh, design uh, design uh, almost four uh, virtual tours. Of course, uh, last year we were we were obliged to to work on the web and to implement a, a virtual tour. But uh, we plan uh, to physical visit uh, these sites, but unfortunately we couldn't do, do so. So the, the, four, uh, the first uh, case study was uh, uh, Palazzo Schifanoia, um, a, a 14th century building where it was uh, through several stratifications. And um, following the seismic events of 2012, uh, the conservation site was addressed by the Joint Commission, uh, a, a particular, a, pecu a peculiar uh, structure arranged by the regional agency and the local superintendency to achieve uh, an aware and of the post earthquake reconstruction following the interventions of the first aid and uh, all the safety measures. Um, the second case, uh, the next slide, please. The second case um, was the Collegiata di Pieve di Cento, and uh, its construction belongs, belongs to the 18th century in, in a dense urban uh, aggregate and urban fabric that causes uh, that caused the complexity of the first aid operations, such as the reconstruction of temporary roof, the control removal of store and storage of rubble the construction of uh, protections and the start of monitoring phases. Of course, the, the removal and the transform, transfer or uh, movable works of art and uh, the protection of the collapse dome uh, from rain uh, and from, uh, from wind and from, um, from, from, from falling uh, inside uh, the, the church. And the next slide, please. And uh, um, another important case study was the Cathedral of Mirandola, one of the most important examples of late Gothic worship building that were um, damaged, and it was damaged from the Emilian, uh, from the Emilian earthquake in 2012. At the time of the earthquake, the plant of the, of the, of the building uh, was characterized by a subdivision in the three naves covered by ribbed cross bolts and uh, queen post wooden roof. Uh, those timber elements together with the vaulted masonry structures of the aisles and the part of the facade collapsed. Thus, um, this conservation site do face it one of the most challenging experiences in the crater area. And uh, finally, uh, the next slide, please. Uh, the next, the next slide, Fabiana, please. Uh, no, the, the ones before. <laughs> okay, Palazzo Sartoretti, thank you. Uh, Palazzo Sartoretti in Reggiolo, uh, facing uh, its rocca. Uh, the building was the result of uh, several stratifications through centuries, and the whole renovation site carried out during the 17th, the, the 18th, and the 19th century. And due to the 2012 Emilia earthquake, the building suffered uh, widespread damages, such as uh, the overturning of the external masonries of the facade, a widespread internal and external crap pattern caused by hammering actions of the wooden structures on the wall structures on the wall's masonries. And um, this conservation site was also a tough experience uh, in consequence of the new use intended to house uh, the local municipality. So in conclusion, um, 
um, this is uh, this was our first edition and this was the first uh, occasion to focus or on four important construction reconstruction sites and uh, we are planning uh, um, we are planning the same uh, important activities inside the, the 2021 uh, summer school edition and uh, it, you can see a first glance of the next agenda uh, planned for the 2021 and um, attendees uh, as said before from uh, Fabiana uh, will be involved in the um, summer school activities from the 5th to the 20th of July. And uh, the call for applications is now open. Thus, we invite all of you to visit the After the Damages uh, website as the application are due by the 25th of, uh, of May. So, um, what can I add? Just say thank you for your attention and, of course, my colleague and I, and my colleague and me, we are available for any questions in the, in the, um, in the sequence. Thank you. Thank you, Manio. Thank you, Fabiana. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, we will take all the questions at the end the, of the session. The end, of course. So please, uh, meanwhile, you can write uh, the, the, your questions or comments in the chat box, and then in the end, we can uh, read about them and discuss sure, all sure. together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I'm going to share my screen for Sinan Burat to announce our next presenter. Uh, Sinan Ojam, you are muted probably, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, I think it's okay now. Yes. Our next presentation uh, is uh, from Maria Macarone. It's titled Ephemeral Between Post-Pandemic City and Nature. Uh, Maria Macarone is a, a licensed architect and is holding a PhD in architecture of parks and gardens and planning. Uh, I think we should start with her uh, presentation. She will not be making the presentation actually uh, due to a uh, health problem. Mm -hmm. uh, she uh, shared her presentation with us and uh, Zeynep uh, Ojang. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yes, I'm sharing it. Mm -hmm. Share sound, share full screen. Oops.
So that was the presentation. That's all we had. So uh, I'm sorry if I skipped it too quickly. So uh, maybe Sinan Bratta, we may proceed with our next presenter. Our next presenter is uh, from the United States. Uh, his name is Nir Bras. Um, he will be making a presentation titled From Open Space, Green Zone, Back to Countryside, uh, in which he will be questioning the changing relations of the city and the countryside and the importance of countryside uh, that has to be replaced in today's planning. Nir Bras. Thank you very, very much. Uh, welcome to the Classic Planning Institute. Um, we are here on the East Coast in the United States. I'll be speaking about the transition from this abstraction of open space and green zone, these, this sort of strange terminology, back to uh, countryside. Um, I think I'm going to take my full 20 minutes, by the way. Uh, Sinan, if that's sure, okay. sure, of course. I'm, I'm just <laughs> warning my, my friend Seda if she's there. Can you please uh, make it 20 minutes? Not Thank 15, you. I, but I, I won't go but beyond I'm, that. Uh, I'm counting, yes. But you know, th what was really beautiful about the, the previous um, presentation was that it talks about the challenges that we are uh, going through. In fact, the Classic Planning Institute. Uh, despite having the name classical, and it is actually a futures institute because with 80, 90% of people expected to live in cities in the next, uh, uh, you know, end of the century, um, futurism is urbanism. So we have all these challenges that we know are coming up. We knew about climate change. We knew about the disruptions in democracy. We knew about the pandemics. We knew about all of them. Now we have three of them together man, we are deep in the future. And we have just watched a hundred years of planning and regional, urban, whatever you want to call it, planning practice that has taken um, sustainable, this is Aarhus, Denmark, sustainable and beautiful fabric. Um, I'm sorry, Nebra, I'm interrupting. Uh, uh, are you screen sharing? Because we, can't, we don't see anything right now. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but I wasn't sure. Don't call me an absent-minded professor. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Sorry, please continue. Thank you. I am, I'm totally. Um, so we're going to talk about open space and green zone and all the challenges that we are expecting. There, there, there are so many of them. Um, we're in the future. We are deep in the future, and we have seen devastating and malignant growth and decline of, of, of city centers, like what used to be charming Aarhus, Denmark, now, now smeared across 20 times the area originally was for only uh, seven times the uh, population growth, while the countryside is declining. It's, it's just not looking as, as nice as it was before. Um, so our what we do is we're, we're going and stewarding the classical methods that were used prior to the early 1900s because we know that they're sustainable for sure. We're talking about methods that have been in place for thousands of years and they actually embed the knowledge. This is the DNA of human, how humans touch the surface of the planet in terms of urbanism and, and, and countryside. And there are knowledge bases that to this day have not even begun to be truly um, documented. For example, classic traffic planning. How did people move around before we had cars? Nobody actually studied that. And countryside stewardship, although it has a little bit here and there is really, um, not attached to urbanism any, in any way, although um, the, the book that, that came out and gave a name to the Institute and everything else um, does speak about this integral link between urbanism and country, town and country. So the values unique to this presentation are gonna be that architecture is central to urbanism 
there is no good urbanism without good architecture. And we know to this day, the traditional classical buildings still make the best streets and places. There is the genuine holism of the method itself. And I'm not gonna go into that, that's explained in the book. Um, and specifically, there's no good urbanism without good countryside hinterland. There is a very strong, a necessary strong link um, that is absolutely necessary um, for um, the, the sustainable kind of fabric that we know that we need in this and the following centuries. So going from open space to green zone, you see all this open space over here, what we called, I was trained to call this open space. And you can probably understand that people who invented the terminology way back when um, considered this open because it wasn't built. But at the, at the end of the day, this is like so fully occupied with raw nature, agriculture, human-made nature, um, and, and um, uh, all sorts of other presences that, that have accrued over time. Here's this place you can see completely humanized the landscape on, on the terrain in, in what are an assembly of really attractive ways of touching the land. And, and those of you who are involved more or less in planning or, or in landscape know how to read this as a multi-layer and loving touch of humans on the land. So the, the, the theme here is that country is as essential to urbanism as silence is to music. And I think that's something that we want to start understanding. We know that there are no two places on earth that are the same. We know that there's no good urbanism without good countryside. We're seeking a dynamic balance, a homeostasis. At the end of the day, that's what we know we need. All of the things that we are doing and all the widgets we have, the green and the walkability, the sustainability, they're all leading in that direction. And the idea of country is not a new idea. Ebenezer Howard, when he wrote his, the first really modern treatise on at least suburban development or, or the extension of cities. Um, he talked about th the idea of country and for him country was essential and he goes on and on and on about it in his diagrams. And his idea was not that we, we build endlessly uh, just sprawling out, but once a town reaches his, his uh, magic number was 32,000, it would leapfrog into the next down past the countryside adjacent to it in a kind of diagram that looked like this where you have all this countryside. This is a soap bubble diagram, but it is very similar um, to um, the diagrams that Chris Dollar created uh, talking about, um, um, about how how settlements are spread in the countryside. And we see that, that in Rajasthan, England, Majorca, um, Kashmir, and Cambodia, the, the, it, it looks, the way humans touch the landscape looks very similar. And this idea that rural is whatever is not urban is actually how we are, are, are identifying this. So we really need to pick ourselves up by the bootstraps and, and, and rediscover, reinvent countryside. It's not a new concept. Romans did it. Romans actually gave centurions and, and other people, locals, they gave them land, they divided it with roads and canals. It's an old method. And it, it went throughout the Roman era area. Um, the uh, idea of uh, uh, this sort of stewarding the landscape, I am sure occurred also in Chinese in this valley and so on other places, I mean, simply I'm not familiar with them. And if somebody knows, please uh, let me know. When we look at landscapes of countryside, and countryside always has some agriculture and it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's not the wilderness, that's for sure. Um, might have some wilderness, but for the most part, it's, it's a human touch. Germany, East, East France, Southwest Germany, East France, um, around Nîmes, Cezanne country, um, um, Japan, San Gimignano, um, uh, um, South England, uh, the Côte d'Azur, Holland, and around uh, uh, Padova. 
you can really see that the way we are occupying the land has major and important similarities. And I'm not talking about agricultural technology and I'm not talking about um, just where people um, choose to, to, to put their, their, their interventions. There, there are some things going on here that I think that we have kind of lost touch with or we've se separated it out to different specialties and they really want to be brought back together again. Um, it, it's kind of like in, in the urban context that the people who build roads have no idea whatsoever uh, where the buildings might be, for example. The, 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 and, and we know that in the in the green uh, realm, the, the the frog people don't know what the fish people are doing. Fish people don't know the tree people. Tree people don't know the water people, and nobody knows the desert people. Um, so when we're talking about how to organically handle countryside, um, we um, we really look to the human for the measure of all that. And the human measure uh, is walking. This is how we get around. This is how we do stuff. This is, and so on and so forth. So we start thinking about the distances traveled within fabric, the distances traveled between settlements as being significant experientially. We're taking the functional open space, green zone and converting it to the experiential countryside using walking. It's not about walkability, it's about the experience of walking that you might have. And we discover that there are organic transport speed. Walking, the 200, uh, the two and a half miles, four kilometers, horse kind of works, it's a little faster. Um, mechanized urban within cities rarely end to end in on a trip is less is rarely more than 20 kilometers uh, miles per hour 30 kilometers an hour it's usually in the 10 to 15 uh, miles an hour or less even there are also mechanized transport in, in the countryside like trains or buses cars and the odd thing is that there is a point at which we start getting jet lag. And that point is very low. It's, it's about 70 miles an hour, um, 100 miles an hour. After that, we start feeling that we travel too fast. So we're talking here about scales of human occupation of land in, in the best sense. And again, the, the, uh, the, there's the idea of how much do you need from the center of urban fabric to countryside to walk so that you have the sense, the presence of that in your daily, everyday experience. We say that anything from 15 minutes to an hour walk with an hour really being a, a maximum to countryside is what we would do. There are other people who have thought about this recently and among them are the new urbanists. However, their, their transect is a little misleading in that if you really look carefully, having taller buildings here and, and, and uh, suburban and rural on the outskirts of a city, this is really a model of 1940s American urbanism, whereas the organic kind of urbanism, yes, we will accept maybe taller buildings in the middle, but we are urban. And then at the very edge, we become rural. And it's at that edge, actually, you can, can think about it later, that you want, might want to put in tall buildings. That's, for, that's another talk. But to give you an example of what this kind of countryside sculpting uh, might look like, this is prairie land in Alberta and Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, it looks flat and it is flat. Um, and this is what gets developed on it for the most part. And, and you know that this is what it is and I'm not gonna qualify it one way or another. The interesting thing is that our studio lead, uh, Jadine Bolt took five European villages at the same scale on that property. And they actually have enough of their own hinterland to support themselves more or less on, on the land here. They came up, they wound up with a larger village and two smaller hamlets, what they call, and 
and on about 10% of the land and the rest of it is various types of agriculture to support the people. And this is all inclusive, the grains, the, the, the meats, the poultry, the you name it, is all in here. And, and, and this is not a, a wannabe green or you know, this is not a, a chicken farm kind of community. This is straight ahead, bona fide, classic planning, just creating communities that could sustain themselves literally until the next meteor hits. Um, the, the look on the inside is obviously charming because you're not going to use architecture that is trying to put people on edge or surprise them or all that. You're going to use architecture that, that is uh, biometrically normal to people. You can read about that in the Art of Classic Planning. Uh, this kind of architecture reduces stress by up to 60%. Uh, steel and glass is, is not really intended for people. The important thing is that you have your edge, you have your urban edge, you have your town edge, your hamlet edge, and then the countryside. So you're looking at something, at two types of fabric, two types of organic matter, so to speak, much like um, the types of, of like organs in a body where they meet at a line. And in general, in nature, everything meets at a line at the end of the day. Um, so th th this is what I said that the buildings co covering uh, no more than 10%, we got what we got. We took a look at the city of Portland, Maine in terms of its 100 year sustainability. And obviously we had to map out great sea level rise because of the location. But then we went back to its last moment of urban homeostasis, which was, we, we we thought it was a before World War II. And we drew the map of the town. That's the red is the buildings in 27. And 1950 is the lots that were already filled in in 1950 after the war. And used that as a basis for the regeneration of the town because the fabric that was built after is like bad fabric. It's like, it, it's like a wound. You're not going to suture an infected wound into the wound and, and close it up with the infection. You're gonna take bad fabric out, remove stuff that's not sustainable. You're simply gonna have no choice. It'll fall down of its own accord eventually, but much of the fabric we've built in the last 50 years, 100 years even, is, is really not sustainable. So it will fall down eventually, and then we can replace it. Hence, we look to a 100 year future. And we went through the avenues, we, we went through the parks hierarchy, we went through the responses to sea level rise. What I want you to see here is that the, the students did all this on their own. I didn't guide them in anything. They literally put this stuff together. They decided that this was countryside within the city and this was urban within the city. And you, if you remember uh, some parts here that look built they were actually in the country and it's okay to live in the country. The whole thing operates like a cell. Countryside operates like a cell where you have bigger villages with hamlets, but this also is the bigger town and the smaller villages. It, it, the, the idea of this biological model seems to, to help uh, in, in, in the way this, um, this seems to uh, go. I. I uh, would like to walk you through um, the kind of code that might be written for creating this kind of thing. But the most important thing in this, and I'm going to really run through these very quickly, is that um, we have principles and assumptions of what we're going to do, like we take the 100 year perspective. Um, the 100 year perspective itself is a, a, an approach that is proving itself well. Uh, the areas, classic plans, the terroir, the physical features, we're talking here about the fabric's DNA. The classic town and country provide a basis. These are the principles that we use in the code. So we're talking about this integral approach. Design at any scale is based on firmness, commodity, and delight. I'm not going to get into that right now but if, I'm happy to answer questions. I think the, the goal of all this is authenticity in whatever it is that we're doing. When in fact, the uses of country 
are, are really, there's a lot of them between the natural habitat areas, the leisure, the rural campuses, the infrastructure. If you take this, everything I've been talking about and start applying it to this, I think you're, you, you might get an, a sense of where we're going. Um, Dear Russ, two minutes left. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna start um, um, collecting back all our thoughts. So the, um, the, the town and country design code does have an urban part for the hamlets and the villages and the, if there are cities in, in that part of country. And then the country design code itself um, has orientations, anthropical uh, notions. Um, the uh, methods for gaining authenticity and authenticity is actually building stuff the way it was built. That's authentic. It's inauthentic to call the authentic inauthentic. Um, protecting views and environments and the uses. It all boils down to, I, I just wanted to share this with you. My, my father was a water resources engineer. My mother was a biologist who did environmental remediation. My father's teacher was Walter Clay Laudermilk, a conservationist and, uh, and uh, a water resources man uh, who uh, went around the world in the 20s and 30s uh, um, and was a great teacher for many. And he has this, his 11th commandment about stewarding the earth. And I think it's time that we want to take this kind of a position. It's not about problem solving. Problem solving, this is the last thing I'm gonna say, is a backwards looking approach. We solve problems we've defined in the past and using problem solving is like walking backwards into the future. So welcome to the future. Thank you for your attention. You're invited to the Classic Planning Institute you can get a little signed book plate if you have a copy of the book. Meet me at cgiclassicplanning.com. We really love beautiful places. Thank you very, very much. And just to remind you that this picture is a post-plague environment. You can see that the people are socially distanced. You can see that the level of consideration is as high the people ever did. And I think we're on the uh, verge of this kind of a new period. M meet me in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Um, so uh, with our next presentation, right? Yes, yes, I shared my screen. Okay. Now, uh, our next presenter is uh, Merve Gurolu Adash. Uh, she will be making a presentation titled An Analysis of the Pandemic Impacts on the Concept of Urban Livability and Urbanization. Uh, Merve has graduated from Karadeniz Technical University Department of Architecture, um, and she has uh, received her master's degree from Yildiz Technical University Department of Architecture, and she is a doctorate uh, student right now. Uh, Mare, um, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Welcome. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, can you see? Uh, Yes, yes, if you make it full screen. Just pressing F5 might work. Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, firstly, uh, I will explain why this topic is chosen. Uh, cities uh, host most of the world's population as a center of economic growth and innovation. Uh, activity and population density in cities are more vulnerable to risks such as natural and man-made disasters. 
The effect of pandemics on cities is not a cure for the first time. In the historical process, it has been clearly seen that problems affecting urban settlements, such as environmental and climate change, human migration and urbanization, economic development and land use patterns, process of globalization, uh, poor quality healthcare and collapse of healthcare systems are among the factors contribute to infectious diseases. Um, Many events uh, in the history emphasize a strong link between the rapid speed of infectious diseases as well as urban policies and plans. Information, preparation, intervention, and adaptation measures are necessary about the patterns underlying pandemics and their effects on cities, especially due to the expectation that issues such as climate change uh, as a result of rapid urbanization and human intervention in natural wildlife habits may increase the frequency of pandemics in the future. It is stated in this context that uh, the recent outbreak of present unpresented opportunity to understand how cities can be affected by pandemics and what actions are necessary to increase the liability of cities by minimizing the impacts. This study aims to understand the effects of the pandemics on cities and concept of liability and to highlight the important lessons that can be learned for livable urban planning after COVID. For this purpose, a detailed review of literature on the concept of livability and pandemic effects on urban livability was evaluated with quantitative uh, research data. It should be acknowledged that research on some themes, uh, such as urban design and uh, environmental factors, is ongoing and, any, and different results may emerge in coming uh, process, given the variable nature of pandemic regarding uh, the limitation of the study. Uh, important, pro important urban problems caused by the COVID-19 pandemic were discussed in the context of principle of liability within the scope of the study. It was discussed how the pandemic process transforms cities and the concept of liability. Uh, in this context, the following questions were intended to be answered. What actions are needed to minimize the pandemic impacts and enhance urban liability? So, urban liability teams were categorized, planning and design principles were determined, main problems caused by the pandemic uh, and key implications for post-COVID planning uh, were identified. Uh, international agendas such as the New Urban Agenda, the Health City Movements, and the Sustainable Dev Development Goals are driving attention to cities increasingly to promote health and environment environmental resilience. Uh, more than half of the world's population lives in cities, and personal 63 of the population is expected to live in cities uh, in uh, 2035. Creating livable cities has become a priority for various industries in parallel to this global trend. Livability interventions uh, represent incremental steps that increase its potential for the long-term development of sustainability. It can be said that the main starting point of the concept of livability uh, is to examine uh, the tools and results of modernist intervention in cities and settlements and to make them more suitable for human nature. It is understood that the concept of livability started to be used in different areas uh, with the concept of livability, quality of life, sustainability or synonyms, especially after the uh, 1950s. Jacobs, uh, Jacobs and Appleyards uh, emphasize the concept of liability by addressing uh, the importance of social relations in the creation of social, economic, and physical environment of cities and the perception of cities as places uh, where social relations are established. Human to, Habitat 2 set, Human Settlements Conference made an important contribution to the sustainability framework of the conference with the concept of liability in 1994. 96. The discussion of urban quality of life as a direct concept took place with this conference. Today, the concept of liability is discussed as a conceptual framework that is important within the framework of competitiveness of cities. Uh, generally agreed uh, principles and values when it comes to liability cities uh, are shown in the table. Uh, the data obtained were analyzed under two headings, uh, major issues revealed by the pandemic and major implications for post-COVID planning. Uh, about housing, uh, the difficulty of taking measures to control the speed of outbreak in slums, such as social distancing and quarantine, which is a combination of factors such as high density, 
uh, services and unstable cost of living has been clearly seen. Uh, people with second homes uh, saw as an escape from major cities uh, where the spread of the virus was faster in the early stages of the COVID uh, outbreak. So healthy and accessible housing policies should be adopted for everyone. And there may be an exchange uh, between the first and second houses due to the reconsideration of the effect of having the first residence in large cities. Uh, this may fuel speculation about housing sales and rental prices, uh, so housing policies should be regulated considering this possibility. Uh, about urban density, uh, there is uncertain evidence uh, on the relationship between intensity and COVID uh, infection rate. This uh, connectivity and size are other variables discussed. A more emphasis was placed on the connectivity than uh, on density while explaining uh, the transmission dynamics of the virus. Uh, the 15-minute uh, neighborhood concept has begun to be adopted uh, in an increasing number of cities worldwide. Uh, websites and mobile phone applications have been developed showing detailed geospatial uh, information and infection that are related to the outbreak. So uh, it is recommended that com uh, compact forms uh, continue to be uh, defended according to early results. It is stated that the 15-minute neighborhood concept will promote sustainable mobility. Mixed-use neighborhood design should be considered. Uh, COVID uh, has given cities a unique opportunity to use internet-based digital solutions. Uh, about transportation, it has been emphasized that travel restrictions significantly reduce pollution uh, directly related to the transport industry. Uh, and it was observed uh, in case of a crisis that walking and bicycle use or individual travel types such as private vehicles uh, were preferred. So measures should be taken to minimize potential health risks in order to regain public confidence in public transport systems in order to reduce private vehicle use. Uh, and non-motorized transport systems that have to decrease outbreaks should be encouraged by investing more in bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. About environment, some studies emphasize a link between air quality and uh, COVID deaths uh, and transmission. Long-term exposure to pollution has been uh, reported to increase vulnerability to pandemics. The decrease in vehicle traffic, agricultural and industrial activities has been shown to contribute to the improvement of water quality. There are uh, cons concerns uh, that medications uh, used in treatment may combina combinate uh, fresh water sources. So priority should be given to necessary regulations to reduce harmful human impacts on natural resources. About public space, some, pub, uh, some public space have been used in different functions for necessary urgent needs. And uh, green uh, spaces have emerged uh, as a vital uh, area for establishing neighborly relationship as well as protecting the physical and mental health of individuals in the pandemic process. So planning and design decisions should take into account the utilization value of public space and regulations should be adopted to provide more green and open space. About health, uh, vulnerable individuals such as uh, slum deliveries, homeless people, illegal workers, and migrant workers were found to have inadequate access to basic healthcare service. So necessary investments uh, and arrangements should be uh, made in primary healthcare for time and effective interventions. About uh, economy, uh, minorities, um, migrants, uh, workers, and urban poor were disproportionately affected by the economic impacts of the pandemic. Uh, High-income employees were more li likely to work from home, whereas low-income employees uh, were less likely to work from home. And uh, transport restrictions and border uh, closures have been reported to disrupt food supply chain chains uh, in cities. So it is necessary to develop real-life programs to support vulnerable and marginalized groups uh, during the outbreak. And uh, the diversification of the urban economic structure and the transition to a more self-sufficient local supply chain should be made in order to cope with the economic impacts of pandemics. About education, it was emphasized that uh, the most vulnerable group of students had poor digital 
tickets and limited access to the necessary equipment and connected with for applied distance education solutions. So priority should be given to more inclusive actions to reduce uh, inequalities and meet the needs of vulnerable groups. About uh, social infrastructure, uh, the pandemic has also raised problems with a diminishing sense of community in some states. Some rich urban people left from high intensity cities to holiday homes. Uh, you know, in the territory of local people, ignoring border closure uh, policies and the risk that they might cause uh, the spread of the pandemic. Uh, and uh, social and class differences in use of public space can be strengthened uh, if the distance work model becomes established. So it is uh, important to develop a sense of community to develop response and rescue capacities and arrangements should be made to ensure equal opportunities in the use of public space. About uh, governance. It has been observed that integrated urban governance and countries that have taken lessons from past pandemics and developed emergency plans have achieved great success in the control of the COVID-19 pandemics. So a more integrated governance systems of the urban level with a long-term community vision, a strong leadership and stakeholder engagement is needed. Uh, the pandemic revealed the current vulnerability of cities it has revealed the need for cities to make radical decisions in, in the short and long term that will ensure that they remain both livable and resilient uh, against pandemics. This study aims to promote this discussion by establishing a work, working framework for defining and evaluating strategies in the context of livability principles for post-COVID-19 cities and list, listing a number of factors that should be considered in table. Key factors and criteria for uh, the possible integration of post COVID 19 measures into cities in the context of liability principles have been, have been highlighted. It has been observed that making necessary arrangements regarding accessible housing delivery, integration of smart solutions into cities, uh, protection, uh, protection of neighborhood scale, support for active transport. On, transport transportation systems, protection of natural resources, educated, uh, educate and qualify public space delivery, access to basic healthcare services, uh, diversification of local economic structure, um, ensuring equal opportunities in education, reduction of class difference and uh, integrated governance at the city level will also increase the livability of cities and thus their resilience against pandemics. It has been observed that access to livable cities after COVID-19 refers to a complex issue, including reducing vulnerability to health problems, increasing the urban living standards uh, in terms of socioeconomic conditions and urban service provision. It has been observed that uh, issues such as population density, economic and social inequalities, poor housing conditions, environmental pollution, accompanied by inadequate infrastructure services, contribute to uh, the spread of pandemic and prevent control efforts. Uh, policies such as providing an uh, providing an uh, integrated infrastructure that allows active transport systems such as pedestrian and bicycle use, uh, allowing flexible use of public open and closed space spaces and acute opportunities in access to public services will make the post-COVID-19 city more durable. For this reason, it is necessary to adopt livable strategies that include solutions that can increase the resilience of cities in environmental, economic and social terms in the face of pandemics. Cities should be contribute to improving the daily life of society, society while preparing for future disasters in response to the, this outbreak uh, in, the, in the context of urban liability. Thank you for, for your listening. That's all. We thank you. Thank you very much. So I would like to remind briefly uh, that we will take the questions and comments at the end of the session. Meanwhile, you can write them uh, in the chat. Uh, yes, let me add, the, you know, once you have written your, or 
raise your hand, whatever method you want to do. Turn on your camera, everyone. Let's turn on the camera and have a discussion, okay? This is not a webinar. This is a symposium. Let's turn on the cameras and see each other. Yes. Meanwhile, we can proceed to our uh, last uh, presenter. Yep. Uh, our last presenter is uh, Tabibu Ali Tabibu. Um, Tabibu is going to is uh, joining us from uh, Comoros Islands. Uh, he uh, is working at the National Center for Documentation and Scientific Research of the Comoros. Um, and his, uh, the, the, his, the title of his presentation is called Climate Crisis, Cities and Cultural Heritage, Case Study of the Island of Gazidja, if I spelled it correctly. Uh, Ali Tabibu, you are muted. Yes. Yes. Do, do you hear me? Yes. yes. You can share your screen now. Thank you. Thank you to introduce me. And uh, I'm very glad to be with you for this uh, symposium. Let me to share all the screen of... Uh, uh, well, sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't. Uh, where is where is it? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. All right. My talk is about climate crisis. My talk is Climate Crisis, Sites and Cultural Heritage Case Study of the Islands of Nazija. Before going off our discussion, let us to see the plan of my discussion. It's heavy. Uh, sorry. sorry, we're seeing we... the presenter mode, not the... Yes, the plan of my... The uh, plan of... No, no, it's not full screen, but it's in the presenter mode. Pardon? Uh, it's not full screen. We can see it in three different uh, diverted ways. Uh, so we uh, see the presenter mode. Okay, 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 okay. And now... No, still, uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, no, still the same. Still the same. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if okay. you don't have I'm, any. I'm, 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 I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading now to. Okay, okay. Take your time. Okay. This. Yeah. Uh, are you using two screens by chance? Yes. It's okay. It's, it's, okay. Yes, it's okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay, this is the plan of my contribution. Uh, there is uh, four many points, as uh, there is a three, as uh, there is uh, the context and uh, the cultural heritage inventory and the climate crisis and uh, their impact and uh, cultural heritage. And uh, this part we will see four points, sea erosion, flood, eruption, and the forizable impact of climate change on, on tangible and intangible heritage. Let us to see the introduction of uh, this uh, presentation. Sorry. Many states in the Comoros on the islands of Ngazija were established near the coast. Climate crises are not far from these sites and impact on coastal archaeological sites, cultural, archaeological sites. Cultural heritage sites are therefore seriously threatened by this coastal region. In addition, the other sites less close to the sea 
are also linked to climate crisis by floods and eruption. For this research work, we propose of the climate crisis and cultural heritage as a study of the islands of Nazija. This work will examine the consequences of the climate crisis to certain different environment of the cultural heritage of Nazija as well as of their impact. Context. Comoros is a country in Africa. They are mainly consist of four islands, include Gazija, this one, Nzuani, Mali, and Mayotte. The Comoros archipelago is located in the southeastern of Africa between the northern Mozambican coast and the northern part of Madagascar. The islands are characterized by a very significant demographic and urban developments with a concentration of population on the coast. We can see the example of all the sites of Bandamaji in the coastal region. And by the presence of an archaeological site, monumental and urban heritage. For example, this urban heritage, this there is a, a hall of fortification of a village of uh, the region of the coast here. The climate is tropical islands type with two seasons, one dry and cold, May to October, the other humid and hot, November to April. Temperatures frequently between minimums of 13 degrees and maximums of 33 degrees. The annual rainfall varies between 2,000 millimeters and 4,000 millimeters. On the Comoros Island, the rainfall changes significantly dependent on the altitude and orientation relative to the relief. In Gazija, rainfall range from 1,300 98 millimeters est of Fumboni to 5,888 millimeters west of Mbaju at the foot of the Kaltara Massif. Gazija is more affected by climate risk, which should do translate into in a crisis in floods and sea level transform place as well as cultural heritage. Sites are sometimes vulnerable. As uh, show this map, we can see some sites and um, different sites of this map and they are affected by this vulnerability. For example, you can see, for example, the floods and the volcano eruption. As we know that this island, the eruption uh, located in this center and all the region of all the region or the set were affected by the eruption of Katara in the center. And there is many examples of uh, this eruption of uh, Katara. And uh, to know about this, we will see the cultural heritage inventory. But this cultural heritage inventory, they are affected by the vulnerability of the climate crisis. As the cultural heritage, for example, we can see the archaeological sites and the historical town sites and the monuments. And we will see some examples. For example, this one. The ecological sites are concerned by this phenomenon of climate crisis. We take the case of the Mbeni 
this age, and the Mbashile, this one, which are avast by the sea. All of these sites date from the 18th century. And the historical town, U sites. Sites where heritage sites exist are also affected by climate crisis. Heritage sites are particularly vulnerable to natural disaster. For example, as we say, volcanic eruption and uh, floods. And for the cultural heritage inventory, there is, for example, some cultural heritage affected. There is, for example, the palace. And this one, this example of the palace of 18th century for the for archaeological site of Mazuin. And we can see and we'll see again. Uh, and this for the cultural heritage inventory, for, for example, for the fortification. And uh, this fortification is uh, it's uh, the fortification we are building to protect the sites, the sites against the pirates from Madagascar for the 18th century, and uh, the protect also the site against the enemy for the interior of the region because has has because each region had their sultana and in this one this other cultural heritage inventory for example there is the mosque and this cultural heritage inventory concern both the cultural heritage tangible and the cultural heritage intangible. Because for this mosque, there is, as a building, it's a cultural heritage tangible, but there is a ritual for this mosque. And for example, this mosque, there is a mosque here, and this uh, a image for the ancient time is this one, it's uh, reconstructed. And as we see here, this mosque, uh, as the legend said that it's a mosque uh, which was con constructed by itself. And uh, in local language, you said uh, Shimuna. But uh, there is others mosque here. And uh, this mosque uh, was again, for example, for, for example, for this community, if for example, there is uh, a miss of raining, there is uh, some ritual we make uh, in this uh, mosque. And we can see this represent a tangible and intangible cultural heritage, and they are, back, they are affected by the sea again. And there is, in the cultural heritage inventory, there is, example, the tombs. There is many examples, but this, uh, some example of this, for example, of this concern, the archaeological sites. For example, here, this is sites of a of 14th century, the city of Mazuini. And this one, we can see this, there is a tomb here, but nowadays is taken by the sea. And there is again, for example, of the city of Mambeni, that there is a tomb, we can found, we can found a tomb in the coast, for example, this excavation, and this tomb, the, among them, they are one which dated of uh, uh, 11th century. And all of them, they are affected by the climate crisis. And the climate crisis and their impact on cultural heritage, as we say, for example, for the, uh, for the archaeological site, and here, for example, this concern, for example, for this one, we can see it concerned by the sea and archaeological sites are ravaged by the sea. Nearly the majority of these sites are covered by risen sea levels. Several elements of construction, industry. If I'm saying industry, it's for example, the uh, archaeological industry as a pottery, and so on. And even tombs are taken by the ocean. And for example, if we see the ecological layer here, we can see 
for example, a burial here, and there is some skeleton here, and we can see here uh, some lay which show us, for example, of a period of tsunami, and we can see again in this layer some ecological materials here. It's not only the ecological sites we are affected by the sea, but there is the site, for example, of this one, we can take the example of the town of the site or of, of uh, Fumuni. This one, it's about the cyclone of, of uh, 2019. And this cyclone of Kenneth, this one, this site we see here is taken by the sea here and uh, after this there is this as a border but it was destroyed by the 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 sea and uh, for this one there is for the climate crisis and the impact on the cultural heritage there is volcanic eruption as we saw in the map the culture as we saw in the map the the eruption of Katala so found, uh, found in, the, in the center of Ngazija. And we can see, we can be in the sea, and but we can see uh, the Katala, uh, the eruption of Katala. And this one, site where heritage sites exist are also affected by climate crisis, heritage sites are particularly vulnerable to natural disaster, as we say, the volcanic eruption, floods, etc. We will see the example of this village of Singani. This is an example of the village of Singani, which was invaded by the volcanic eruption in 1970. Seven. And uh, after the disaster, we can see the new, the new village of Singani, this damage of the sites. And there is many examples in, in Gazija, in Comoros, specifically in Gazija, for example, this a site of south of Gazija that there was uh, eruption and we, uh, in, in the ground we can see a hole and uh, we can see some ecological material in the in, other, in the ground of the hole. And after the disaster, this concerned the disaster after the river and after the, the river we can show some ecological sites taken by the river. For example, this, the seat of Mazuini again, this one, and we can see here, it's the river who take some part of the city and this one, and for this corner, we can see the hole underground here, we can see, and this other corner, and if we see here, we can see some ecological material here. The climate crisis and their impact on cultural heritage, on saying again, the foods. And there is some example here. As for the floods, we consider the floods of Bambao and Hambu in 2012. All of this phenomenon illustrate the natural crisis which affected the cultural heritage of Comoros. Climate crisis and their impact again. The forezable impact of climate change on tangible heritage. Climate change has a direct physical impact on the building heritage, both on the appearance, and this here in the appearance you can see easily of a building and the structure. Indeed, historical, historical building are more linked to the ground than modern building. They are more porous, take water from the ground, transport it 
throw of their structure and evacuate it by evaporation, generating side affected like oxidation. Changes in the sea level prevents streams from flowing freely, which increase the humidity of the soil and therefore the humidity condition of the building heritage. By conclusion, the sites and the cultural heritage of Comoros of the islands of Gazija contain many climate crises which deserve to be taken into account in relation to sites in evaluation. If no accompanying measures are taken, there is a risk of having a site without cultural heritage or rather a having heritage in danger. It will be necessary to safeguard this ancestral heritage for present and future generations. For this study must be done to prevent the damage linked to climate crisis against the cultural heritage of Comoros. More information, we can see some reference for this uh, study. Ladies and gentlemen, participants, organizers, thank you so much for your attention. We thank you. And thanks for the timing, everyone. Talk sharing, okay. Uh, thank you very much for all these uh, precise uh, presentations, precise on time and precise, precise on their topic. Um, maybe, uh, dear Sinan Burak, we may ask the uh, audience if they have any questions or comments. Yes, uh, but before that, I would like, like to make uh, round up and establish uh, some parallel parallels between um, the presentations that have been made in this session. Actually, we have we can make. Uh, I was able to group them into two. Um, the two of them are basically related with uh, the, the after the damages uh, presentation by Fabiana and Manleo and. Uh, uh, the Tabib, Ali Tabibu's uh, presentation, uh, they had similarities because uh, Ali Tabibu and, uh, and Fabiano both talked about several types of disasters and their relations with cultural heritage and how to preserve those uh, cultural heritage sites or tangible or intangible heritages, uh, whatever. And they had uh, actually uh, maybe uh, Comoros Islands may be included in the after the damages uh, <laughs> studies as well because there are different uh, sites and those tropical islands uh, are very much vulnerable to climate change uh, and in uh, Tabibu's case we see also uh, other kinds of disasters like river erosion, volcanic eruption, uh, and it's uh, which are taking and sea level rise, coastal floods. They are taking all do, those disasters to whole to a whole new level, I guess. Uh, and uh, the other group of presentations uh, are Maria Macarones near Brussels and maybe Marve Gurolu's presentations. Uh, they are both related with uh, open spaces in general. Uh, they are both uh, questioning the way we build our cities, the way we look at the countryside, the way we look at the open spaces in the cities and how we create those and how we use those. Actually, uh, uh, they're all approaching uh, uh, them from others, uh, other stand uh, uh, points of views, but uh, they all have a questioning uh, stance, if you ask me. Uh, and the, 
there are actually this is this is a strange mix of uh, presentations i'd like to ask if any of our attendees has any questions to ask to the presenters yeah, let's i i got i got one let me start so the first uh, question is why don't you turn on the camera everyone this is not a webinar this is a symposium in the past year, each one of us probably has been trying to figure out how to do these things online. And I think most of the people are strongly influenced by those commercial webinars that are done by the companies where somebody is reading the, you know, the, the questions and saying, oh, somebody asked this. And then somebody is answering and there's no discussion. There's no interaction. This is not a webinar. This is a symposium. So we would like to encourage the discussion uh, the real discussion where people stand up and say, oh, no, what did you say? That's not true. I don't agree because instead I, you know, that kind of discussion, what happens in the real thing? It's online, of course, but at least in terms of interaction, we can have something very close to a real symposium. So I would uh, like to ask everyone to turn on their camera. And if you have a question, turn on your microphone and, and come up with the question. I, I got a number of them, but I would like to, way for the audience to do this. Uh, meanwhile, I have a question, if I may. Um, so I was uh, fascinated by the work that uh, Nir Buras shared with us uh, regarding this uh, village. I don't know uh, if you uh, called it as a village. I, I, I'm sorry about that. I missed that. Uh, a village in Alberta. And uh, you, you were superimposing five European cities in the same area of that uh, uh, village. Uh, and you said that it's, it's uh, there in order to create communities uh, to support themselves. So it was, it was there already in, in front of you. I mean, these uh, areas that they uh, occupy, let's say. Um, it, it was interesting because I was going to ask uh, a, a, a similar question to uh, Merve Girolo, if they have, you know, if there is a possibility to apply their uh, work on a certain city, for instance, because the way uh, Nirvuras um, um, explained his stance and then uh, ex um, uh, and put forward an example regarding this, this way of uh, looking towards the cities, I think it's, it's a, a great opportunity to, to follow up this uh, extensive uh, research of yours. So first, I would like to ask Nir Buras whether this kind of uh, superimposition may be applied to other, um, let's say, uh, larger scale of villages and or, 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 or geographically changing spaces. And then I'm going to uh, further uh, ask for the comments of uh, Merve uh, Gurolo later on. Thank you, yours. Thank you. Uh Absolutely. Uh, the, you know, our thinking that we're all so different from each other is really getting in the way. Um, the way humans occupy the land for the last 5,000 years for sure is identical in all cultures, pretty much. And the differences are really um, micronic. Uh, you know, like we, we share 99.5% or something of, of our chromosomes with chimpanzees. It's the same in urbanism. It's all the same, 99.5% is identical, all cultures. And then you have some of the, the external differences, the stylistic stuff and so on and so forth um, and local, local stuff. So yeah, um, I live according to uh, certain rules. One of them is we're all the same and we haven't changed. Homo post-Covidus is the same as Homo Mm -hmm. uh, ante modernismus, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're still the same. And we've been living for 100 years, not applying the stuff we know. Um, you can take the wonderful thing about living today is all these fabulous tools we have for, for uh, fooling around with maps and pictures and words and so on and so forth. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, yeah, you can take uh, the, the idea of of um, taking villages, superimposing them. Yeah, a good, you know, a mediocre artist copies and a good artist steals. So just do it. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for this comment. Uh, I wonder, Merve uh, Giroldo would like to comment on further notes on their research. Uh, I can say uh, about uh, my research, uh, I studied uh, about livability also uh, in space and, and uh, its effects on space. Uh, rapid uh, and uncontrolled uh, urbanization uh, may result in social, economic, and uh, fetal uh, fragmentation, fragmentation uh, and uh, in drastic uh, deterioration of the quality of the urban environment. Uh, and uh, I can say uh, about the pandemic impacts on cities also. Uh, maybe uh, I think, uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, Rather than a drastic change, uh, the pandemic uh, will perhaps only improve our uh, practice, practice, uh, but leave our uh, core approaches and uh, values unchanged. Uh, and also, uh, maybe uh, people uh, uh, left uh, big cities and uh, uh, go uh, small cities or uh, countryside. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we will see in the pictures. <laughs> I can't say. They started beginning from uh, yesterday, and because this is the last day of. Uh, I'm very sorry, the timing is so bad. My door is ringing. So I will uh, pass the uh, uh, stage to Sinamur. Okay. Now, uh, what I, uh, I. I took about a three pages of notes from your presentations. Uh, I'd like to ask to Fabiano or Manlio, whoever, uh, whichever uh, you want to uh, answer this question, but um, you, ha you have been running this studio and research uh, for three years, if I'm correct. Um, if I may uh, answer your question, um, it's not so correct because um, uh, our research uh, in the meantime, it started uh, about uh, ten years ago. Oh, because, sorry. Uh, on the aftermath of the of the earthquake, but also because uh, we linked our research activities from the uh, points of view of conservation of built heritage or historic built heritage and in documentation of built heritage uh, since from the um, 2009 earthquake uh, in L'Aquila. Mm -hmm. So. Um, about four or five great uh, earthquakes in Italy uh, in among, in among uh, 15 years that we are studying and documenting the damages and the strategies implemented, implemented for the reconstruction of uh, urban tissues, uh, urban, uh, um, urban aggregates uh, from, the, um, uh, from the center of Italy up to the Emilia Romagna region. Now we are uh, collaborating with um, Croatia for the earthquake uh, on the other side of the Adriatic Sea. So uh, the, um, after the damages, um, summer school was uh, in, um, planned, was uh, uh, implemented to uh, consolidate all the um, all the results that came from this uh, research activity in the field. Uh, and um, for that reason, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, I think that this kind of re research uh, is, is not going to, to interrupt because unfortunately we always have um, tragedies, crises uh, and um, mm. damages uh, from uh, natural disasters, but also from uh, uh, from um, human activities. Uh, also, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that on uh, on the occasion of this uh, 2021 uh, summer school, but perhaps in the next uh, 2022, we are going to face the uh, the, the crisis, made, the damages made by uh, tourism. So. Um, it's, it's not going to be the focus of this year, but I, I think that the next year uh, we're going to arrange something about it. I don't know if I uh, answered your, your question. Uh, yes, it did. And the, I would like to ask as well, 
uh, how does your research involve the intangible heritage? And because all most of the answer, most of the examples you showed were tangible ones, the structures, the buildings, etc. Intangible ones are re re really, really much harder to preserve, document, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know. How do you deal with with the intangible heritage? Uh, In all so different <laughs> examples, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Fabiana, uh, I, um, I, uh, I'm going to answer your, uh, answer your question. Uh, uh, we focus on intangible issues, but uh, of course, uh, our skills is, are linked to tangible one. So mm -hmm. I know that. Um, in the in our research group, uh, in the, our partnership, there are um, activities activities that uh, could uh, focus on the intangible ones, but not at the moment. If okay, I can uh, add something from this point of view, we are trying to collaborate uh, also with the uh, startups, uh, companies, small and medium companies in our region and so on, and with international research group in order to um, document uh, through, for instance, ICT tools, uh, some uh, other type of uh, data from uh, uh, stories, experiences, uh, uh, in order also to uh, to have not to have a method, but to to collect experiences all over, all over the world, uh, because we are mainly architects, uh, but we'd like to cooperate with other disciplines, and uh, we we find in this in this moment uh, that, uh, for instance, ICT platforms uh, uh, could help us uh, also to integrate di different kind of resources and sources from oral to also, so I think, intangible to tangible ones. But it's... Uh, uh, if I may add sorry, something... To sorry, if, if, if yeah. you don't mind, as a chair of the symposium, I step in and I do something different because this is not a discussion. This is not a discussion. It's an interview. So each one of us, starting from me, is going to have one minute and say whatever they want. And we're going to go in a row. And this is more like a discussion. So I want to say two things. One is uh, Tabibu. So what he's showing there is what could happen to each one of our cities, at least the ones close to the sea. So the change in level of the sea, which is happening, hence the climate change, it's going to change. Some of our cities, New Orleans, went underwater recently. And in the future, we know that this phenomenon is, is coming up. So uh, um, there's something we should talk about a little bit more. And Uzzi University, Drum Dynamic Research on Urban Morphology Laboratory is very interested in these topics. So Tabibu, if you want to start a cooperation, we're ready for that. The other point is uh, uh, one minute and I pass it on to Zainab, okay? And we move on that direction. And each one of us names the second, the, the one after, okay? So there's not a chair, it's like a sequence. So after when I'm done, I'm saying Zainab, you go. And then Zainab names somebody else. And we go all the way like this. Uh, Ni has raised another issue. Do you know, we forgot about the countryside. And even the definition of the United States government, countryside is what is not urban. Let me propose another one. Countryside is where the food comes from. So no countryside, no food, you guys. So let's talk about this. Zainab, now it's you. Now you name the next one. That's more like a discussion, okay? Sorry for this. I think I already uh, commented uh, on, on several points. So maybe we can hear about uh, uh, but um, uh, I don't know, um, Claudia Pesco Solido thinks. Near Buras, uh, near Buras, please, please do do help me, please. Thank you. I, I really, I find, I find the actual presentations really interesting, and it, they show, um, you know, these various types of frameworks within. Uh, we're all considering kind of the same things, like, what do we do next? Uh, or how are we going to do it? Um, uh, yeah, countryside is where the food comes from. And, and Paris, to this day, is about 20% urban and 80% rural, the whole region around. And it provides all the food for Paris, almost, as far as I know. And, and, and that actually does still work. Um, 
the, I had a question actually for the folks from the earthquake. Um, um, Manlio and, and Fabiana, but it's a very technical question. Um, I, I was just curious if there was um, native seismic resistant construction in the area and what happened to it? Um, we have several damages from, for uh, vernacular buildings in the countryside. Um, the earthquake uh, stroke uh, quite um, quite a lot of uh, this kind of buildings. The buildings the buildings that belongs to the uh, production of uh, our uh, our food from the countryside. Um, and the pity is that uh, more or less the sixty percent of these buildings. Um, are, are being have been demolished because they weren't they were it wasn't possible to um, consolidate or to strengthen their structural behavior, and this is a really pity for our uh, countryside landscape. Uh, on the same time, uh, many damages were uh, many damages uh, struck the. Um, um, worship places, and we left. Uh, we lost a, a lot of um, um, uh, worship places, uh, buildings. Alio, would you name the next one to talk? Somebody who hasn't spoken yet. Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm because I'm very interested in his presentation. I talk. I uh, call uh, Tabibu uh, because yes. I'm very interested in um, how did they manage the. Um, if they manage and how they manage the um, the post crisis uh, phases. Uh, so there is a uh, for the heritage. There is not a, a national political for this one, but for the civil society, there is some to manage about it. It's clear or no? Yeah, yeah, it's clear. Okay. Okay. Tabibo, you name the next one. Pardon? Name the next one who is supposed to speak. Pick one who hasn't spoken yet and name him. And it's going to be his turn. Her, his, whatever. You're not used to this kind of activity, okay? Sorry. <laughs> Michaela, please. Okay, sorry, sorry. I no, sorry, because I have an answer for Tabibu. Uh, and so I enter the debate. Uh, uh, Tabibu, you say there is no um, uh, uh, government service for heritage. Is it correct? What do you mean exactly? Uh, it, uh, you, do you refer just to uh, the problem related uh, to um, the, the damage or, or do you refer to the lack of the system? You know, I'm interested in, in, in this part of the problem. So I'm concerned with heritage preservation and the, how it is managed in the different uh, um, places. Yeah, thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, I Thank you. As uh, I'm saying, now there is, a, there is not a sufficient uh, financial issue to manage the site after damage and uh, the site stay in the risk. And uh, there is not a national politic to preserve the sites. Uh, and it's a stay a big problem for the practitioner and for the pro for the professional or for the cultural heritage, and they will find many. For example, we can see, for example, the archaeological site taken by the sea, and uh, for this result, too, for the future, there is uh, archaeological underwater, but there is not uh, archaeological in uh, the terrestrial, and there is a, a big problem issue for for this. And uh, it's uh, for the 
uh, even in the monuments, but the, for example, in the monuments of for the Sultana, well, the, there is uh, some program about it, but uh, the other site for the archaeological site and uh, the urban abandon, uh, there is not uh, a program about it. Thank you. Thank you very yes. much. <laughs> Nirvuras, you were saying something about your muted. I have a question for Tabibu. I'm yes, really please. sorry. I um, uh, Maybe I missed it. Uh, I think I missed it in the beginning of your presentation. I'm curious about the cultures and time frames of the um, sites you were discussing, I just it just went past me. I don't get to you properly. What cultures, what are the names of the cultures or the people who, the sites that you, know, you are exploring and what time frames, when were these all put in? Um, I understood the pirates and everything else, but is most, um, is it, uh. You know who, who are who are these folks? Yeah, yeah. For the pirates, it's uh, the the ancient sites protect uh, uh, for the ancient sites for the kingdom and uh, the system of uh, Comoros uh, area. Each region has a as a powerful uh, kingdom, and uh, the kingdom there is a fortification to protect the sites, and uh, there is uh, some sites. We are in the coast and uh, we can find, but many for them in the coast, but we can find others uh, uh, in the center of uh, the, the island. When were they built? Uh, it was a start uh, at the, the history. It was started by the 18th, uh, 14th century. Not before. But the, but, but the conflict uh, for the pirate, it's uh, the 18th century. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, should so, we wrap it up by yeah. reminding everyone where the Komodos are? Oh no, this is just- Yes, you are welcome. Uh, where the, this is in Turkish, what you see, Komorlar, Adalar. Anyhow, that's where they are, between Madagascar and Africa. And the showing just the results of the survey, what is the future of archaeological sites? Um, and waving you goodbye until tomorrow morning. We will begin again at nine o'clock. Is that the timing? Yes, Istanbul yes. time. Uh, we will begin at nine o'clock at Istanbul time. And um, what I'm going to do right now is stop sharing, stop recording. Um, I cannot stop live streaming because I have to go to another computer to do this to the server and uh, wave you goodbye until tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. 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 Bye b